Yes, Mr Hodge. Commissioner, the next witness is Mr Wilkins. Just before Mr Wilkins is sworn in, I'll just indicate we've also received a witness statement from Ms Fiona Wardlaw, the Group Executive for People and Culture at AMP Limited. And I tender that statement, which is dated the 2nd of November 2018, and it has document ID AMP.6000.0345.0019. Together with its exhibits. That statement and its exhibits becomes Exhibit 7.110. Mr Wilkins, do you mind just standing a moment while I ask first whether you'd prefer to make an oath or take an affirmation? An oath, Commissioner. I swear, Mr Wilkins, please. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you very much, Mr. Wilkins. Do sit down. Yes, Mr. Hollow. Your full name is Michael John Wilkins. Yes. And your address is 33 Alfred Street, Sydney. Is that yes. Correct? And you are the acting chief executive officer of AMP Limited. Yes. And you are also a director of the company. Yes. Um, you're attending the commission today in response to a summons, is that correct? Yes. And do you have the summons with you? I do. Commissioner, I tender the summons. Uh, exhibit 7.111, the summons to Mr Wilkins. Mr Wilkins, you have provided a statement in response to a request from the commission, is that correct? Yes. And the statement is dated 21 November 2018, and you've exhibited some documents to the statement? That's correct. Are the contents of the statement true and correct? Yes. Commissioner, um, the ID for the statement is AMP 6000-0384-0001. And I tender the statement and its exhibits. The statement and exhibits of Mr Wilkins becomes exhibit 7.112. Thank you, Mr Hollow. Yes, Mr Hodge. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr Wilkins, you've been the acting CEO of AMP since 20 April 2018. That's correct. And your time as acting CEO ends on the 1st of December of this year? That is correct. You've been a director of AMP Limited since September 2016? Yes. And you are also a non-executive director of AMP Life Limited and National Mutual Life Association of Australasia Limited? Yes. Before you were appointed as the acting CEO, you were a member of the AMP Audit and Risk Committee? Um, the Audit Committee and the Risk Committee. I'm sorry. You were a member of each of those committees since, I think, September 2016? Um, I don't recall those dates, but about that time. And you were the chairman of the risk committee between May 2017 and your appointment as acting CEO? Yes. And you were the interim executive chairman of AMP between 30 April 2018 and 21 June 2018 when Mr Murray was appointed as the chairman? That's right. Now, before you joined AMP, you were, between 2008 and 2015, the managing director and CEO of Insurance Australia Group Limited? Yes. And you've also held various memberships of a wide variety of industry and advisory groups? Yes. And that includes the Australian Government's Financial Sector Advisory Council and the Business Council of Australia? Yes. What I want to turn to now is to deal particularly with remediation at AMP. And you were asked by the Commission, as Mr Hollow has already indicated, to provide a statement that addresses a number of topics? Yes. And one of those topics was concerned with the remediation that AMP is undertaking in relation to its advice business? Yes. And that remediation is concerned with two issues. One is inappropriate advice? Yes. And the other is what is commonly referred to as fees for no service? That's correct. Now, AMP is, as we understand it, presently in the process of remediating customers or attempting to remediate customers for inappropriate advice and fees for no service? We're in the process of, uh, of doing that, yes. And 
the need for customer remediation was originally prompted by ASIC's wealth management project? Yes, that's correct. And that project, I think, began or was established in about October 2014? Uh, some, sometime around then. And then at some point after that, that was when AMP began looking at how it might go about remediating customers who had suffered from inappropriate advice or fees for no service. Yeah, I think the program began in 2016. That, and that was the review and remediation program, is that right? Yes. And that, that particular program, I think, was commenced in about July of 2016? That's You're my not. understanding. And as we understand it, there were uh, three parts to the program. One is remediation for inappropriate advice. Yes. <clears throat> the second is ongoing service fee remediation. That's the fees for no service remediation. Yes. And the third is fee remediation to investigate where clients may have been charged fees in error. Yes. And the ongoing service fee component is different to the bowler and ring fencing conduct that was the subject of the round two hearings of this that's, commission? That's correct. And AMP is separately remediating or has remediated for that conduct? My understanding is we've remediated those customers. Now, that review and remediation program, which commenced in about July of 2016, it had been prompted by a request from ASIC in March 2016? That's my understanding. And ASIC had outlined two requirements to AMP in relation to the program? Uh, again, my understanding. And just to run through, to confirm this is your understanding, the first was ASIC required AMP to identify all serious compliance concerns back to 1 January 2009? Correct. And the second was ASIC also required AMP to confirm that all service obligations had been delivered in line with the documented agreements back to 1 July 2008? Yes. And AMP went about trying to address those two requirements of ASIC by including what I think is referred to as a look back review in the review and remediation program? Yes. And the look back program is essentially an historical review of advisor conduct and advice to see whether inappropriate advice or fees to no service conduct has occurred. Yes. And AMP originally agreed with ASIC to undertake this review and remediation program for inappropriate advice for the period 1 January 2009 to 30 June 2015? Yes. And recently AMP has extended or agreed with ASIC to extend the period up to 30 June 2017? Yes. And AMP originally agreed with ASIC to undertake the review, I'm sorry, review and remediation for fees for no service for the period 1 July 2008 to 30 June 2015? Yes. And again, recently AMP has agreed to extend this period to include the period from 1 July 2015 through to 31 December 2017? Yes. And I think you explain in your statement that the reason that you've agreed to do this is because, or well, for two reasons, the first is to ensure customers are treated fairly. Yes. And the second is because this is what you anticipate ASIC is going to require. Yes. Now, ASIC's report 499, which is the report dealing with fees for no service, was released in October 2016? Yes. And in that report, AMP was then listed as at 31 August 2016 as estimating that it would pay $4.6 million in compensation for fees for no service? Yes. And in March 2017, ASIC's report 515 was released, which relates to effectively how large institutions oversee their advisors. Yes. And in that report, AMP is listed as having paid total compensation as at 31 December 2016 of approximately 
$7.3 million to 429 customers in respect of 19 advisors? Yes. More recently, on the 27th of July, 2018... Let's go back a moment, Mr Hodge. You said, I think, 7.3 million to 429 customers? Yes. Yes. In respect of 19 advisors? Yes. And then more recently, Mr Wilkins, on the 27th of July, 2018, AMP announced that it expected to provision $290 million in post-tax dollars for remediation in relation to reports 499 and 515? Yes. And that total amount then of $290 million includes remediation for both inappropriate advice and fees for no service? Yes. But that's in post-tax dollars? Yes, it is. And subject to certain or arrived at in accordance with a particular accounting standard, is that right? It accords with accounting standards, but it's also uh, derived from estimates that have been made from sampling of various files. <coughs> the schedule to your statement to the Commission sets out the number of customers remediated and to be remediated and amounts paid and to be paid as AMP now estimates it for fees for no service and inappropriate advice? Yes. And that schedule is, as we understand it, current as at 31 October 2018? Yes. And we can bring up the schedule. It's AMP.6000.0384.0001, which is Mr Wilkins' witness statement, at .0022. And the highlighting makes it a little difficult to read on the screen, but if we just focus on the column that is second from the left, which is headed total program, and this is the column setting out the current estimate of remediation for both inappropriate advice and fees for no service. Yes. And we see the number of customers reviewed to date is 3,495. Yes. The number of customers remediated is 2,363. <coughs> uh, number of customers offered remediation. I'm sorry, offered remediation, yes. quite right, is 2,363. Yes. The amount offered is $20 million. Yes. The number of customers remediated is 2018. Yes. The amount paid to date is $15.6 million. Yes. The number of customers to be reviewed is 217,845. Yes. The number of customers estimated to be remediated is 107,735. Yes. And the total amount estimated to be remediated is $440.4 million. Yes. And that amount comprises $80.7 million for inappropriate advice. Yes. And $359.7 million for fees for no service. Yes. And just on that last amount on fees for no service, does that include the cost to AMP of carrying out the review and the actual program costs as distinct from the amounts for remediation? No, it's only the, the amounts for the remediation, um, it, which is inclusive of um, uh, lost earnings on those fees. Yes, but not the cost to not, AMP not of actually AMP. reviewing the files. No. Now... obviously the case that the amounts that are now listed in the schedule to your statement are significantly higher than the amounts that had been estimated and observed as at 2016? Yes. And you say in your statement that AMP did not fully appreciate 
the size or complexity of the issue in 2016? Yes. And why do you think that was, Mr Wilkins? I think that um, we did not have a full appreciation of the, um, uh, the impact of, of this uh, on the uh, small number of sample files that we looked at. Uh, we believe that um, that was uh, most of the issues that we were facing. And uh, I think that AMP believed, uh, as did the industry, that this was not uh, such a large issue. I see. What we might do is just look through some of the background to AMP's attempts to date to try to put in place the review and remediation program. As we understand it, in August of 2017, AMP had proposed a particular strategy for reviewing and remediating clients that were charged for services that were not provided? Yes. And at that time, AMP had identified that there was approximately $838 million in ongoing fees related to AMP products in the period 1 July 2018 to 30 June 2015. 2018? 20, 20, 20. I'm sorry, 2000, 1 July 2008 to 30 June 2015. Yes. And that was in respect of 3,911 advisors. Yes. And the number of ongoing service fees, if you, I'm sorry, the value of ongoing service fees, if you included the period January to June 2008 and July to December 2015, was closer to a billion dollars. Of that order. And then sometime in 2017, it became apparent that the strategy that AMP had proposed for its review and remediation program would not meet customer and regulator expectations for timely remediation? Yes. And that was for both the fees for no service and inappropriate advice components? Yes. And so in November of 2017, Deloitte was engaged to undertake a review of the program? Yes. And the purpose of that review was to try to establish a turnaround strategy to accelerate the program? Yes, we, we wanted to accelerate the program a at that time. Now, what had happened, or what did happen, was that by February of 2018, the Review and Remediation Committee had endorsed what is referred to as a baseline approach to remediation? The, yes. And for fees for no service, the baseline approach was to establish a full listing of customers charged ongoing service fees and use key risk indicators to segment the advisors into cohorts depending on whether they were high risk or not and review the book of clients for the high risk advisors? Yes. And for inappropriate advice, there was a similar process that was going to be used to use KRIs in order to identify high risk advisors and then sample their advice? Yes. And it was initially thought that under this baseline approach, remediation would take approximately five years? Yes. It was a five-year plan for remediation. Yes. And ultimately, you recognised, or AMP recognised, that there had been inappropriate assumptions made in order to think that it could be done in five years? Yes. And that, in fact, it would take <coughs> nine years to carry out the baseline approach? It was certainly going to take considerably longer than, than five years to be able to, to follow that approach. Well, I think if we bring up tab two to your statement, which is AMP.6000.0372.0097, and go to page dot zero one zero zero. We see at the top of the page, what's been explained is that 
once you adjust the assumptions that the new update, updated baseline plan would take nine years to complete with a cost of $1.185 billion. Yes. And as a consequence, a decision was made in April of 2018 that there needed to be an additional focus to try to expedite this remediation? Yes. And was that additional focus <coughs> prompted in part by the reputational effects on AMP of the evidence that was heard during round two of the Royal Commission? Possibly in part, although for um, uh, a period towards the end of 2017 and into 2018, the AMP board was uh, becoming increasingly concerned that um, the remediation process was proceeding too slowly. And did the board have a view as to why the process was proceeding too slowly? The um, process that was being followed was uh, one where um, files were being collected on a, an individual advisor basis and examined uh, on that basis. Um, the advisor network is very geographically um, diverse uh, and when we looked at it, uh, particularly in uh, April of, uh, of 2018, we just felt that there needed to be a, a better way to, to be able to do this if we were going to effectively remediate customers in an appropriate time frame. And there was also a community expectation around the timeliness with which you would carry out remediation? Well, there's certainly a community expectation about that, but it was more important um, to AMP that customers be remediated as quickly and as completely as possible. I understand. The, in the most extreme case where you were talking about customers who might have been charged fees but not had services provided at the beginning of 2008, you were facing the prospect that it could take up to 17 years after they'd been charged those fees for them to be remediated. Yes. And the board felt that was unacceptable. Yes. And I think you'd agree the community would also think, that the Australian community would think that is unacceptable. Yes. And ASIC, the regulator, also thought it was unacceptable. Yes. And in June of 2018, the board was told that for AMP to achieve its objectives of accelerating customer remediation, there would need to be a significant reset of the review and remediation program? Yes. And <coughs> the intention, as we understand it, since the fix and rebuild team was created in May 2018, is to commit to ASIC that customers will be remediated within three years? That was the target. And there was consideration, I think, of a few different time frames or possible time frames for remediation? There were considerations of um, time frames of three to five years initially. Um, to challenge the, the process, um, I asked the question what it would take to be able to do it within 18 months because I felt that customers needed to be remediated as quickly as they could. The uh, response was that we physically could not get it done in 18 months and three years was the, uh, the most likely time frame to be able to complete this. And is it the case that as at today, AMP expects to be able to complete the remediation within three years of 1 July 2018? That is still our target. And I think you have now 150 staff working on remediation? Yes. And the revised total estimate of the cost of the program is $778 million? Yes, that includes the, um, the costs to carry out the, uh, uh, of the program yes. uh, to its completion. That's both, so both, it has effectively four lots of costs in it. It has the cost of remediation together, together with lost earnings for inappropriate advice. Yes. It has the costs of remediation together with lost earnings for fees for no service. Yes. 
it has the costs of carrying out the reviews necessary in order to remediate for inappropriate advice. Yes. And it has the costs of carrying out the reviews necessary in order to remediate for fees for no service. Yes. And that's what makes up the $778 million. Yes. And that amount of $778 million doesn't include any recoveries from advisors or insurers? No, it's a gross number. But presumably those are two possibilities that AMP would pursue, either to see if it could recover some of this cost from its advisors or to claim on insurance policies it might have the benefit of. Yes. And I think it might be helpful given the disparity between the $290 million in post-tax provisioning and the $778 million as the revised total estimate, if you just explain what the reason for that difference is? The, um, the post-tax amount of $291 million um, equates to about $415 million on a pre-tax basis. Um, AMP already had made a provision of around $50 million that was uh, uh, there as at um, 31 December 2017. Uh, there are then uh, those costs uh, that were mentioned to uh, run the program. We have said that we expect that that will be $50 million per annum post-tax for three years, so uh, roughly $200 million, so it's getting into that into that order of, uh, of uh, where the, the $700 million comes from. I see. Now, the expectation that the remediation will be completed within three years of 1 July 2018 is based, as we understand it, on two assumptions. The first is that no further problems are identified. We will deal separately with, with further problems. The 150 uh, staff that you mentioned are broken into three groups. One of those groups is, is looking at ongoing issues, but it also, um, our estimate at the moment is, is based on the samples that we have done, um, and uh, uh, we believe that uh, it, it's the best estimate that we can make from those samples at this time. The other assumption is that AMP is able to agree and agree quickly with ASIC on its approach to remediation? <coughs> yes. And as of yet, AMP has not been able to reach an agreement on a number of policy positions with ASIC? We have agreed a number of positions with ASIC. Um, I think there are still two matters that are outstanding. And what are those matters, Mr Wilkins? One of those uh, relates to um, the evidence that will be acceptable uh, for service having been provided, uh, in that we have suggested that testimonials from customers that they have received the service would be appropriate. That hasn't been agreed with ASIC as yet. And the second one is the treatment of um, uh, issues where we find a, a, um, a fail from the delivery of service, but not in respect of the entirety of, the, of that service. That is that some, some services uh, were provided, and it's a question uh, around not whether that's a fail or not, because we've said we accept that that is a fail. It's a question around the quantum of uh, remediation. And so if we take each of those in turn, the issue about testimonials is that ASIC would like you to have your own records of having provided some sort of service? Yes. Rather than advisors now going to customers and asking them to sign something to say they were provided with service 10 yes. years ago? Yes. And as to the issue of quantum, is that concerned or related to a particular issue, which is you might have an ongoing service fee agreement that requires the advisor to carry out an annual review, but also provides that the advisor will do certain other things like send newsletters or something along those lines. 
that would be one of the issues, but it could be also that the advisor will help with some particular tax advice at some stage during the year. We'll review a Centrelink um, uh, position uh, if, if some circumstances change. And in those situations, we believe that um, that was agreed with the customer, that part of the service was given, and, and uh, we think that it would then be uh, inappropriate to refund all of the fees because some of the service had been given. I understand. It's not an issue that AMP is taking the position, for example, that it may not have provided the annual review, but it did provide, it did send out newsletters or something like that, so therefore it should be entitled to retain some amount of the fee. No, it's, it's more particular to uh, some of the the um, subsets of service that, that were in the, uh, uh, in the fee statement and the fact that those subsets were delivered uh, to the customer. There was an issue as at September of this year about the customers that were in scope for the review and remediation and particularly customers who'd paid under $500 per annum. Yes. And AMP had been seeking to exclude customers who paid under $500 per annum from the review and remediation program. Yes. And the total amount of fees relating to those contracts in the period 1 July 2008 to 31 December 2017 was $158 million. Uh, of that order. And there were about 271,000 customers who fell within that, oh, sorry, customer contracts that fell within that category. Uh, of that order. Yes. And ASIC said those customers shouldn't be excluded. Yes. And has AMP now agreed to include those customers? Yes. And what was the reason that AMP had initially sought to exclude them? We believe that um, at less than $500 in terms of the, the total fee, that it was more likely to be uh, general advice rather than personal advice and could be excluded from the, uh, uh, from the, the process. I see. Until AMP agrees with ASIC on these final policy issues, it's continuing to remediate in accordance with the baseline approach? Yes. And that means it's continuing to remediate on the basis of an approach estimated to take nine years? Yes. And do you regard that as a satisfactory situation? I'd like to, like to finalise the agreement with ASIC. We did say um, that we expected that the remediation under the revised proposal would commence in the last quarter of 2018, and we are still hopeful that we'll be able to begin it um, at that stage. And we, if we are able to do that, we still remain confident that we will be able to remedi remediate customers uh, within three years. And what happens if ASIC won't move? I believe that ASIC um, will, uh, will move. We have a cooperative relationship with, with ASIC. We've been able to deal with a number of differences between the, the groupings and we've come to, uh, to those final two uh, issues that are now outstanding uh, between us. Uh, and I'm sure that we will be able to resolve that. Um, the relationship uh, has been good as we've gone through this process. Um, and uh, I think both ASIC and AMP want to see customers being remediated. The position as at September of this year, and I think as of now, is that AMP has not paid compensation for fees for no service other than in respect of fees for no service issues that had previously been reported to the regulator? Yes. And so those types of issues that had previously been reported to the regulator were things like bowler and the ring fencing conduct. Yes. And I think I effectively asked you a double barrel question, so I should check. It's, it was the case as at 31 October 2018 that AMP still hasn't remediated 
anything for fees for no service under this review and remediation program? Not under the revised program. We need to reach agreement with ASIC before we can um, commence that. I think the review and remediation program is concerned with things other than things like bowler and ring fencing that had been separately reported to the regulator? Yes. So the things that have been separately reported, like bowler and ring fencing, that's been dealt with separately for remediation? Those customers have been remediated. Yes. The review and remediation program and its more general concern with the extent of fees for no service has not yet had not as of 31 October 2018 paid anything for fees for no service conduct to customers? No. And as at today, it still hasn't paid anything? No. I want to move now to deal with understanding the size of the problem and the problem confronting AMP. One of the problems that AMP has had is in ascertaining the number of customers and the amount for remediation. Yes. And as at 31 March 2018, the AMP board was told that each month the level of knowledge on potential compensable events improves, but for most remediation activity, accurate determination of the compensable amount for any given client is not known until almost immediately prior to payment? Yes, because we were um, doing that on a file-by-file -file basis um, and <coughs> we needed to actually look through each of those files to, so to determine it. And, and so now you've changed your approach and that's how you've come up with your revised estimate in, by attempting to apply some sort of analytics to make an estimate of the amount for the fees for no service? Yes. And. Once you've made that sort of estimate, if we just think about the numbers and go back to the figures that were in your schedule. In your schedule, you have an estimate of $359.7 million for fees for no service. Yes. And is that amount arrived at by excluding the fees that were under $500 per annum? No, it includes the fees under $500 uh, per annum um, based on uh, some of the further sampling uh, that we have been able to, to undertake. Okay. And it's for the period from 1 January 2008 through until when? Uh, until uh, 30 June 2017. And the estimate of the total amount of ongoing service fees that was taken in by AMP during that period is in the order of a billion dollars? Uh, over that period, yes. And so that would suggest that more than a third of the ongoing <coughs> service fees that were taken in by AMP over that period will need to now be refunded? Um, this also includes compensation uh, for the uh, for the lost, lost earnings, earnings over it. that, which compounds over uh, over a considerable period of time. So it's less than a third, then. Yes. Do you know what proportion it is? Uh, I can find it, Mr. Hodge, but I don't know it off the top of my head. Is it presumably it must be something in the order of at least twenty percent, once you take into account or discount for lost earnings? Uh, possibly just not of, sure. of that order, I'm just not sure. Is that something that you've turned your attention to, trying to understand what proportion of the total ongoing service fees taken in over that almost 10 year period were for services that were never provided? Yes, yes I have. Um, and our, um, our sampling has shown that um, the major time frame that there were issues were from 2008 until 2015. Subsequent to that time, and we've seen that there is a, has been a considerable tailing off in terms of uh, incidences of, uh, of fee for no service. And presumably a reason for that is that from 2000, from mid-2015, it was necessary, the two-year period 
hit for clients to have to opt in to continue their ongoing service agreements? That would be one of the reasons, but I think also um, our processes and procedures have um, become better uh, over time uh, such that um, we are seeing significantly less instances um, today than we were even two years ago. Are you also seeing a significant decrease in the value of ongoing service fees that are charged? Um, not overly. But some decrease? Some, some decrease. And what does it say to you about the quality of your advisor network that there was this significant, meaningful amount of fees being charged up until 2015 for services that were never provided? I think that it, it says that um, our advisor network, uh, upon the, um, uh, upon the, the um, beginning of uh, the FOFA reforms, was still finding its way in terms of um, the new world of uh, fee for for service, uh, and uh, it's taken some time for uh, the uh, understanding to um, uh, to uh, be well placed, as well as um, just some of the reforms in terms of the uh, educational uh, undertakings that uh, AMPs licensees have been uh, putting into the uh, into the network, uh, together with uh, some of the. Uh, audit processes and the changes that we've made to those processes over time has, has improved the outcomes. It's odd though, isn't it? Because AMP tried to get the jump on commissions being removed and switched to fees for service in mid-2010, didn't it? That's my understanding. So does it seem surprising to you that five years, or it took five years after AMP had switched over to a fees for service model for its advisors to understand that they needed to provide services in exchange for the fees? I think that uh, a number of them uh, did understand that, but uh, also a number uh, did not. Um, and uh, as, uh, as the... Um, Educational standards have improved as the um, uh, the policies and procedures that AMP has uh, put in place have tightened up. We've seen an improvement um, in that. AMP is the one that actually collects the money from the clients' accounts or wealth products. Yes, and then it distributes it to the authorised representatives and the advisors. Yes. And AMP is the one who switched in 2010 from commissions over to fees for service. Yes. And do you regard it as a failing then on the part of AMP back in 2010 and for the next five years not to have adequately educated its advisor network that they needed to actually provide services in exchange for the fees they were charging? Yes, our, our policies and, and procedures were, were uh, not uh, appropriate or fit for purpose at that time. Do you wonder, though, why it is that you would need to tell your advisors that if they're charging a fee for a service, they have to provide the service? Um, it would be a normal expectation that, that people would uh, would understand that. Well, that's right. Any, outside of financial advisors, it's hard to think of any professional group of people that think if they charge money for a service, it's OK not to provide the service. You would think <coughs> that uh, where a fee has been agreed, the service would be delivered. That's certainly what most professions are used to. Yes. What do you think it says about the cultural norms of financial advisors that that doesn't seem to have not only not universally been the case, but in, to such a ex significant extent not been the case? I think that um, the financial uh, advice 
industry is um, improving. I think where it was coming from was uh, a transaction by transaction uh, type uh, arrangement where commissions, including trail commissions, uh, continued uh, and there was, uh, in the case of, uh, of that environment, no expectation that services would be delivered for those uh, trail commissions. If we sort of cut to the heart of it, until the switch to fees for service, financial advisors were effectively a distribution network or channel for wealth products and insurance products. Yes. And they were paid commissions by the manufacturers of the wealth products or the insurance products in order to distribute the products <coughs> to consumers. Yes. And they didn't, they were paid trail commissions ordinarily as part of that. Yes. And they didn't need to provide a service to the consumer in exchange for the trail commission. The commission was being paid by the product manufacturer. That's right. It was a payment by the product manufacturer. It didn't require them to provide any service to the consumer. No. What it likely did was to command some loyalty from the advisor back to the product manufacturer so that they wouldn't switch the client to a different product. Yes, the, the trail commission was in recognition of the, um, of the product remaining in force um, with the company. And the mental shift that many financial advisors seem to find difficult was to understand they were no longer a distribution network for product manufacturers. They were now professionals providing advice and acting in the best interests of clients. That was certainly a, um, a significant change for a number of uh, people in the advice network, uh, uh, particularly at the introduction of, uh, of the FOFA reforms. And was it also, well, it must have been a change for AMP pre-FOFA because AMP had switched to fees for service back in 2010. Yes. But the issue also <coughs> seems to be one that AMP needed to switch its mentality because it was, up until it switched to fees for no service, a product manufacturer that owned an advice network that it used as a distribution network for its products. Yes. And is it fair to say what seems to have happened is that it switched to fees for service, but they were fees for service in name only. They were really treated by many as simply trail commissions continuing. Certainly the, um, uh, in a number of instances, the services were not being provided. Um, so I think that the change in, um, in approach needed to be both um, within AMP but also uh, from the advisors themselves. We'll come back at the end to the change within AMP. What I want to move to now is the bowler and ring fencing conduct. You were also asked to address what's referred to as the bowler and ring fencing conduct that was examined in round two of the Commission's hearings as part of your statement. Yes. And the broad strokes of that conduct were that fees were left on according to a business rule that those fees could be left on for a period of time, generally three months or 90 days before a client who had been left without an advisor was transferred over to a new advisor? Yes. And AMP initially made a breach notification to ASIC in May 2015 about clients being charged fees when they were kept in the bowler pool? That's my understanding. And that, that was before you joined the board of AMP? Yes. And at the time that was described as a failure of system processes? That's my understanding. And then on the 23rd of November 2016, ASIC was told that this, what is referred to as the 90-day exception, had continued to occur after 2016? Um, or it continued to occur into 2016? Yes. 
and that a direction had been given on 15 November 2016 to cease the practice immediately. Yes. And I think this year on the 17th of October 2018, AMP notified ASIC that the practice had been intentional. AMP notified that there had been a, a business uh, rule that was in place um, uh, that uh, had had led to the the outcome that you described. Yes, is there is there something about my use of the word intentional that you're disagreeing with? There, the business rule was the business had an rule, intentional. The, the, the business rule it? was that that um, that those fees would be left on for ninety days. And AMP had reported this conduct as a breach on the 3rd of May 2017? Uh, yes. Now, AMP has to date remediated about $3.7 million to 15,712 customers for the bowler and ring fencing conduct. Um, I think the... Uh, the Total remediation is $4.7 million to those 15,712 customers. Thank you. And the remediation, as you understand it, is now complete? Yes. The bowler and ring fencing conduct could only occur where there was an approval of the exception or an approval of the application of the 90-day business rule by the managing director of the advice licensee. Where the business rule was being applied, I think in um, some of the uh, instances there were administrative errors uh, that also contributed to that where the fees um, uh, just were not turned off through administrative issues rather than a, a decision made around the, uh, the application of the business rule. Certainly in some cases a specific approval was given by the managing director to allow the fees to continue. Yes. And it was convenient or financially beneficial to AMP to keep the fees turned on because then the book of clients would be more valuable to AMP when it's on sold it to an authorised representative? Well, it would certainly maintain the, the value if that book was going to be on sold if it was in the, the resale pool. Well, if it wasn't maintained, then it would be financially detrimental to AMP. Yes. And that, it would seem, is the fundamental reason that AMP's senior managers and the managing director were happy to allow the fees to continue to be charged because it was financially advantageous for AMP. I don't know what the, um, the specific reasoning uh, for it was. <coughs> um, uh, certainly, AMP would have benefited from the uh, uh, from the fees um, in the sum total all up of, of that instance of 4.7 million dollars, um, but I uh, I can't speak for what the particular issues uh, uh, may have been uh, because there could have been things such as just administrative ease uh, of not turning them off and a belief that um, uh, that uh, services would be provided once the, um, the uh, book had been either on sold or another advisor had been assigned to them. I see. You say in your statement that AMP has made a number of changes to address the bowler and ring fencing conduct? Yes. And the first change is that AMP received assurance from Deloitte that the 90-day exception ceased to operate from November 2016? Yes. The second change is that AMP has reinforced existing policies concerning fees for no service? Yes. The third change is that AMP has made enhancements to the control framework of its advice licensees? Yes. The fourth change is that Clayton Utes was asked to conduct an investigation in relation to the conduct? Yes. The fifth change is that Deloitte has conducted a culture audit. Yes. And that's known, I think, as Project Luminous. Yes. The sixth change is that there has been an external workplace investigation known as Project White. Yes. 
And the seventh change is that you say consequences for particular employees involved in the bowler conduct and ring, ring fencing conduct have occurred? Yes. And there were, as we understand it from your statement, one executive whose employment was terminated? Yes. Four managers and executives who had their deferred incentive payments forfeited? Yes. And one manager received a written warning? Yes. Now, one of the other changes that you refer to and that we mentioned a moment ago was the culture audit that was done by Deloitte. Yes. And that was conducted by Deloitte into AMP's risk culture? Into the culture of the uh, advice business. I'm sorry, the advice business's risk culture, is that yes. right? And when did Deloitte commence that audit? Um, I can't recall, Mr Hodge, I'm sorry. That's right, but it finalised its report in about July of this year? Uh, yes, around that time. And AMP is currently conducting a risk culture project? Yes. And the working group within AMP carrying out the project is to develop, implement, monitor and evaluate the program of work to address the risk culture issues identified in the advice business and more broadly where relevant? Yes. And that in turn has led to the generation of, I think something called a summary of risk cultural themes? Yes. And that has then been incorporated into something called Project Green? It's been con a consideration for Project Green, uh, which is the self-assessment that uh, AMP is undertaking for, uh, uh, for APRA uh, in respect of the report that APRA produced on uh, CBA. Now, as at September 2018, as we understand it, the view being reported to the board was that additional work has been completed to address the risk culture? There has been some additional work done, yes. And within advice and more broadly, work to clarify and reinforce expectations of leaders has commenced for all leaders and will be used to reinforce expectations and risk management accountabilities? Yes. Is there a concern that even as at today, the leaders within the advice business may not understand the expectations of at least the AMP board in relation to risk culture? No, I think that the leaders in the advice business today are very well aware of the expectations in regard to uh, the risk culture and behaviours that we expect to see. I see. You say in your statement that you consider it improbable that the relevant conduct, that is the bowler and ring fencing conduct, would occur within AMP in the future? Yes. And is that because of those seven changes that we've talked about, all the seven things that have been done? Yes, and uh, particularly the, um, uh, the procedural changes and the reinforcement of, uh, uh, of the policies that, uh, that uh, existed at the time that the bowler conduct was being undertaken. Um, but uh, uh, we've reinforced the importance of turning fees off where uh, no service can be provided. Is it fair to say, do you think that even today there continues to be some risk within AMP that the charging of fees for no service or the inappropriateness of that conduct is not fully understood as being unacceptable? I don't think that that's uh, a correct statement. I, I think that um, uh, certainly people within AMP and particularly in the advice business are very well aware of, uh, of what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. I think as you know, and as we referred to before, AMP had told ASIC in November of 2016 that a direction had been given to cease the retaining of fees when clients were transferred into Bowler. Yes. And Deloitte 
had conducted an, ins uh, an assurance review to confirm that the conduct ceased in November of 2016? Yes. But on the 31st of May 2018, AMP made a breach notification to ASIC regarding intentional conduct by the managing director of one of AMP's advice licensees of keeping fees on while clients had no advisor? Yes, we made that, um, uh, that advice, but it, it uh, was a different issue uh, to the bowler issue. Well, that conduct occurred in December of 2017? Yes. And when you say it was a different issue, it was different in what respect? The uh, advisor concerned was being uh, off board <coughs> for compliance uh, issues uh, and was in the process of attempting to uh, sell his book at that time. Uh, it was not coming into uh, the AMP bowler pool, uh, uh, nor was it um, uh, being ring-fenced for any further sale. The instruction was given to turn the fees off and in uh, a number of instances those fees were turned off. I'm sorry, the instruction was given to not turn the fees off? The instruction was given to turn the fees off. But it was overridden, wasn't it, by the managing director? Yes. So the policy of AMP, which is the fees should be turned off, was attempted to be implemented? Yes. But the managing director of the advice licensee override <coughs> that policy and wanted to keep the fees on. Yes. And the breach report said that the breach indicates a lack of understanding and significant error of judgment on the part of senior employees of the advice licensee as to the circumstances in which ongoing service fees could be left on following a compliance termination. That is what the, um, the notice to ASIC uh, said. Um, I should point out, though, that in this uh, situation, the matter was uh, immediately escalated uh, within the advice business and the uh, decision was uh, overturned uh, within four days of the instruction having been given by the uh, then managing director, uh, which uh, meant that uh, uh, that the issue uh, was contained, but it also showed to me that the uh, policies and procedures that we had put in place and the knowledge that people inside the advice business uh, had um, was effective and was working, the fact that people were prepared to call that, that issue out. I see. Now, as at June 2018, Deloitte was still undertaking or undertaking work to unequivocally confirm whether there are any further instances of fees charged for no service to customers in the bowler and licensee orphan pools due to administrative errors? Um, I'm not aware of the, the date uh, of that. I'm not aware of that, um, uh, that situation, 2018. Oh, you're not aware of work? I'm not saying that it is continuing. I'm just saying you're still doing work or in the middle of the year you are still doing work to confirm I'm, that it I'm, had been turned off. I'm, I'm not aware of that, Mr Hodge. All right. And as at September 2018, AMP is undertaking work within advice and more broadly to clarify and reinforce expectations of leaders and has commenced that work for all leaders. Yes. And that's to be completed by December of 2018. That is the target date. Is there a concern within AMP that even now it still needs to do a lot of work to ensure that its senior leaders understand the culture in relation to risk and compliance that the AMP board wants? Um, the uh, work is, is ongoing, um, uh, but I, I do believe that there is a much better awareness now of the risk and compliance culture that um, is expected, partially as a result of some of the consequences that, that uh, have been shown for previous uh, behaviour but also partially through the reinforcement that, uh, that we have put in place in terms of, the, um, uh, of uh, the policies and procedures and more particularly what is expected of people inside AMP. 
in terms of that culture that you're trying to encourage is one of the issues that AMP is still waiting for the new CEO to commence in order to shape what I think you refer to as the culture aspiration of AMP? Um, a new CEO is, um, is coming into um, the organisation and um, has been given a, uh, uh, a mandate to uh, transform the, uh, the organisation. However, one of the things that uh, I've tried to do during my time as, as acting CEO is to uh, be very clear about what behaviours are acceptable and what behaviours are not acceptable. Uh, and that's been communicated right through uh, AMP. And I don't believe that the new CEO will uh, have, a, have a changed view around uh, behaviour which is acceptable and behaviour which is not acceptable. Given your very significant experience in corporate life before you came to AMP. Do you have a view as to what it is that has gone wrong in AMP in terms of its culture and the ability of its employees to know what is right and what is wrong? Um, I think that um Part of the uh, uh, part of the issue has been um, the um, uh, the lack of clarity around what is acceptable, uh, the lack of consequences that uh, come from uh, inappropriate uh, behaviour. But that's been compounded by uh, an underinvestment that uh, AMP has made in its. Uh, uh, risk uh, and compliance and governance uh, systems, uh, which we're attempting to, to address now. And I can understand that there may, be, may have been and has been an underinvestment in the risk function within the business, the processes and compliance processes within the business. That's the last point that you're making. Yes. I'm wondering though, how does how does a culture develop within an advice business where anybody thinks it's okay to charge money for a service and not provide the service? I don't think I have an answer to that, Mr Hodge. I suppose one of the reasons why that would seem to be a very interesting question is because it would seem logical that in order to understand how to change that culture, you would need to understand how it has arisen in the first place. We have um, uh, attempted to understand that through uh, staff surveys and, uh, and other um, means, um, but I don't think that there's any uh, one particular issue that stands out that says that's the uh, root cause of, of the issue. What my concern has been is to make sure that uh, people understand what is expected of them now, and what behaviours are acceptable, and to then make sure that the organisation is backing that up with appropriate um, uh, controls and processes and systems uh, to be able to uh, capture uh, issues when they uh, arise, or preferably to make sure that they don't arise in the first place. And so what I think the point you're making is, is you as the acting CEO, it's it's impossible now for you to go back to a period of time when you weren't even involved in the business to try to understand how it is that this culture had developed in the first place. What you have to do is, from the top, instill the right values and the right culture within the business. Yes. And that's what you've sought to do to make sure your employees have complete clarity as to what you regard as right and wrong. Yes. And by doing that, the business will hopefully reinforce the correct ethical norms. Um, I think it's important that, that um, the right tone is set by the, the, the leaders in the organisation and that um, everyone is well aware of, uh, of what is expected uh, of them. And certainly in um, communications that uh, I've sent, uh, as well in uh, as in uh, those of uh, 
other members of the leadership team at, uh, at AMP that's been made <coughs> very clear, but I think it, it is important that leaders walk the talk in terms of, uh, of what they're doing uh, in that regard. And one of the ways in which you reinforce to your employees what conduct is acceptable and unacceptable is by showing demonstrable consequences for those employees who step outside of acceptable behaviours. Yes. And that's what you've sought to do in relation to the bowler and ring fencing conduct. Yes. Can I turn then to a related topic, which is about the relationship between AMP and its advice licensees and together with that, the remuneration and professionalisation of advisors. In July of this year, you began to consider how to reduce both the conduct and compliance risk in the advice business. Yes. And one of the propositions that you put forward to the board was that this might be done by exiting smaller, less productive practices and reducing the extent of advisor incentives and payments. Yes. And that strategy was considered at the July 2018 board meeting. Um, that's my recollection. And AMP's strategy that it now has for the period 2018 to 2022 is to transition AMP from primarily a face-to-face -face aligned advice channel structure to a set of more integrated and digitally enabled channels that broadens customer reach and delivers advice with greater efficiency and lower risk. Yes. And that strategy, as we understand it, recognises a number of things. First, that there's increased regulator scrutiny in relation to the advice businesses. Yes. Second, that there are higher professional standards that will be applied and that could result in, I think the estimate is 20 to 50% of advisors exiting the industry? Certainly 20% uh, um, we think will exit. Third, that there are significant economic shifts that have occurred post FOFA, which change the way in which advisors are remunerated and the risk reward structures. Yes. Fourth, that there are significant advancements in technology which present both opportunities but also threats to the existing business models. Yes. And that would particularly be things like what's sometimes referred to as a robo-advice. Yes. And fifth, that there are shifts in consumer expectations and demographics. Yes. Now, AMP remunerates the authorised representatives through what are known as the settlement and recognition terms. Yes. And AMP also conducts a development management and advice scheme. Yes. And the way that that scheme operates is that a practice is ranked by reference to a balanced scorecard. Yes. And the ranking that the practice receives is applied to the revenue of the practice. It's a, it is a, a percentage of the uh, revenue of the, of the practice that is generated for the previous year, is my understanding. Right. And what it... I just have to ask you to keep your voice up a little, Mr Wilkins, thank you. Yes, go on. So if we just go back, you have a ranking of the practice. The ranking of the practice is used in order to generate a, effectively a multiplier that is applied to the revenue of the practice for the preceding year in order to come up with something like a bonus that's provided to the practice? It's a, um, it is a, uh, a development management and, and advice uh, reward which is based, uh, as you said, on a, on a balanced scorecard, but it is aimed at um, ensuring that practices uh, are uh, passing audit, uh, continuing to uh, show uh, uh, or meet their continuing professional development obligations that they have, um, uh, has a business plan that is viable and is demonstrating growth against that, uh, against that business plan. To be eligible, um, you have to actually be able to, to meet those criteria. If you don't, 
then there is no payment. I see. As we understand it, AMP has recognised internally that it needs to change the incentives that it offers to authorised representatives? We are uh, certainly looking at the um, uh, DMA uh, arrangements. Uh, they are under active consideration right now. And the DMA arrangements are this development management and advice program and this type of bonus structure that you have? Yes, this is, that, that is the, the structure, yes. But the challenge for AMP is that this involves or seems to involve moving away from the use of its advisor distribution channel? Um, we think that there will always be a role for face-to-face -face, uh, advice. Um, what we do think, though, is that technology can be uh, used to both assist um, in the professionalism uh, and the productivity that comes from that face-to-face -face, uh, network. Uh, we do think that um, there can be uh, uh, greater uh, compliance and other productivity tools also built in uh, through the use of technology. Uh, I, I think that um, there is a place for robo-advice, which you mentioned earlier, but I, uh, I think it's, uh, it is somewhat limited um, because of the generic nature uh, that we're talking about. What we are seeking to do is to supplement the face-to-face um, -face channel with um, productivity tools that, uh, that enable it to, to be able to deliver better advice on a more um, uh, efficient and effective basis uh, to our customers. Do you think the reality is that the number of Australians that actually require ongoing face-to-face -face advice is much more limited than it might seem when you look at the number of Australians presently being charged ongoing advice fees? No, no I don't. I, I think that um, uh, advice is an important uh, component for most Australians. Sadly, not enough Australians actually take advice. And I think that, that they and ultimately the nation uh, will be worse off for not taking uh, that advice. There's a difference though, isn't there, between taking advice and needing ongoing advice over the course of your life and paying for it? That becomes an individual uh, choice as to whether you see the benefits of, uh, of having an ongoing uh, relationship or whether you want to deal on a transactional uh, basis, um, the advice network can cater for both of those scenarios. I think you've made the point in one of your papers that most Australians will need some sort of financial advice at some point in their lives. Yes. That though seems to carry with it the sting that most Australians probably don't need ongoing advice every year for their entire working lives? Um, I don't know that I, I would characterise it as most Australians. I, I think that um, uh, that um, estimate is different and uh, their needs are different and what we need to be able to do is to make sure that the product and service offerings that we have, particularly the service offering, um, caters to that need. And is AMP thought about this? Has it conducted any sort of investigation or research to try to figure out whether the number of customers it presently has signed up to ongoing fee agreements reasonably reflects the number of customers that actually have a need for ongoing fee agreements? <coughs> uh, not to my knowledge. And doesn't that seem like a fundamental part of understanding where the AMP advice business is at because if, for example, realistically only 20% of the customers presently on ongoing fee agreements actually need to be on ongoing fee agreements, then that suggests there's a lot of Australians paying for advice they don't need. Um, I think that the ongoing fee agreements are transparent to the customers and the customers need to, uh, are the ones that will ultimately elect uh, where they want to go in terms of either ongoing fee agreements or in terms of the uh, of uh, uh, advice at, at specific stages. One way to make it even more transparent than it is would be to require 
opt-ins every year rather than every two years? We think that every two years uh, is appropriate. Um, uh, given just the administrative burden that would be there for the customer but also for the advisor. Um, but further, we, we think that um, some improvements can be made in that, uh, in that two-year uh, scenario. If, uh, if there is a not, uh, not an opt-in, then there would be a unilateral turning off of, of the fees rather than it, uh, it continuing. We think two years is, uh, is a, a more optimal timing than one. And what, why is that? I did, I mean, two years just seems entirely arbitrary, save that it means that financial advisors don't need to get their fees reauthorised every year. Well, I think there's an administrative issue that, that comes with it, including the, the administrative issue that would be there for the customers as well as for the advisors. But that's not really an answer, is it? Because on that basis, you could say they, if they, you only have to have them opt in every 10 years, then that will be more administratively convenient to both the financial advisor and the customer as well. Uh, uh, of course. So that doesn't really tell us what is an ideal length. It doesn't tell us anything, I don't think. Well, we, we feel that, that two years is the, the appropriate time if you have an ongoing relationship um, to, um, to renew that. Um, uh, but uh, other time periods may also be appropriate. You have to give a fee disclosure statement every year? Yes. So there's already, it's not as if you're not in a position where you don't have to send something every year anyway to the client. It's true. And it's not as if there's some significant extra burden involved in actually providing advice because the premise of it is you're providing ongoing advice throughout the year. Yes. It's just very difficult to see what the justification is other than it might be financially detrimental to AMP because customers would more often reflect upon and decide to turn off their ongoing fees. Uh, I don't know that, that your last statement actually uh, follows from, uh, from that. If customers are, are getting service uh, and are finding value in the, uh, in the advice, then I don't see that they would, uh, they would turn their, uh, want to turn their fees off. That's entirely uh, their choice, of course. And what about requiring the product manufacturers to confirm at whatever the opt-in period is that the client has opted back in to pay the fees. Is there any reason in AMP's view not to do that? Uh, no, and we support that. Um, the, uh, um, in one of the submissions that we have made uh, to the Royal Commission, we have uh, said that in the event that uh, there is not obvious opt-in after two years, then the fees uh, should be turned off. And what about having ongoing fees charged out of superannuation products? Does AMP have a view about that? Um, it, it depends on the uh, on the nature of the of the superannuation fund and the advice that is um, uh, is being uh, given. And if we just try to tease that out, if it's a my super product, then it's very difficult to see what justification there could be for ongoing fees to be paid out of a my super product. Uh, yes. If it's a self-managed superannuation fund, then it may make more sense to have ongoing fees paid out of that product. Yes. If it's some sort of choice product, then, but not, well, a choice product within one of the funds operated by an AMP trustee, then what about then? Where does the balance lie in AMP's view? Um, I, I think in that, scenario, uh, it does come down to uh, the, um, the decision of the customer and how often that choice is, um, is being exercised. That is, <coughs> if the customer is choosing to go into a particular choice growth fund that AMP is operating and they're planning to leave their money there for the next 25 years, doesn't really make a lot of sense that they're paying an ongoing advice fee coming out of that fund. Um, in in that scenario, um, you could you could say that yes, it depends on the on the nature of the fund and um, what other um, service or advice was was being given. More like well, 
they can only the whole point is if they're paying fees out of their superannuation product they can only get advice in relation to their superannuation and retirement can't they yes so it can't be for anything else other than superannuation really no no it can't but it can it can be a a, a change in strategy that may be uh, uh, warranted um, given a change in circumstances uh, for those people can we move then to grandfathering in July of this year the board considered a memorandum in relation to grandfathered commissions uh, yes and the memorandum said that the removal of grandfathered commission would impact several areas including reductions of approximately 20 percent in practice revenue uh, yes that's my recollection and an increase in bowler update and bowler I think it's bowler update, but in any event, an increase in bowler activity is probably the point. Um, there, there is a potential for, for an increase in, um, in bowler. And any removal of grandfathered commissions would reduce the projected returns on bowler buyback and servicing strategy? Yes. AMP has made a number of statements in its submission to the Commission in response to the interim report about the removal of grandfathered commissions? Yes. And AMP says that the passage of the FOFA legislation was highly contentious and that it is doubtful whether the FOFA legislation would have passed at all and become law had the Minister not provided reassurances to advisers that commissions would be grandfathered? Yes. And AMP has questioned the statement in the interim report that grandfathering arrangements were temporary and exceptional measures? Yes. And AMP has relied upon a submission of Treasury in support of the proposition that ending grandfathering would be complicated and difficult to legislate? Yes. And AMP has also relied on a submission of Treasury in support of the proposition that ending grandfathering could negatively impact the viability of some financial advisor practices with implications for their owners, employees and customers? Uh, yes. And AMP has also submitted that there may be constitutional issues associated with banning grandfathered commissions. Um, that was in uh, response to um, uh, to one of the uh, rounds I, I, of uh, the Royal Commission. I think our position on grandfathered commission has moved on from that time. I think. Sorry, I don't understand what you mean. It's moved on since that time. Uh, Commissioner, we've uh, we have uh, reviewed the uh, the position of of uh, grandfathered commissions, and uh, uh, are now saying that we fa we favour a phased uh, approach to to uh, remove grandfathered commissions. Well, I think just to be clear, we can bring up the submission if necessary. You've still submitted, even in response to the interim report that there may be constitutional issues associated with banning grandfathered commissions. Yes. But you've said ultimately AMP does not now oppose moving away from grandfathered commissions in light of community sentiment surrounding grandfathered commissions. Yes, and with consultation um, uh, with, the, uh, with the industry uh, over uh, the time frame for... Over the time period. Yes. And... AMP has submitted that a reasonable transition period is required to provide sufficient time for industry participants to implement required changes. Yes. I just want to understand some aspects of that. The industry was consulted on the FOFA reforms in 2011. Mm, that is my understanding. AMP had already moved from commissions to fees to service in 2010 for investment products. I see. The FOFA reforms commenced on 1 July 2012? Uh, 12, 13, um, well, of that order, Mr. I think Mr. compliance was required by 1 July 2013. Yes. ASIC allowed a further period of 12 months where it adopted a facilitative approach to compliance. Uh, my understanding again, Mr. Hodge. And 
almost eight years have now passed since the industry was first consulted about the FOFA reforms? Um, yes. How can it really be that more time is needed to implement the required changes? I, I think that um, in respect of some grandfathered commissions, um, services are being provided uh, for that, uh, that remuneration uh, and uh, there is a, a time that will be necessary for advisors to be able to go and, uh, and make alternative arrangements with their customers to um, change the, the basis of their remuneration from their grandfathered uh, commissions to, um, uh, to a, uh, a more contemporary fee-for-service type arrangement. I mean, that just seems like an extraordinary explanation for deferring it, really. This is eight years after AMP itself switched over to fees for service, five years after the ban commenced, four years after the end of the facilitative pro approach of ASIC. Surely by now, those advisors who are actually providing a service in exchange for fees have switched from grandfathered commissions. Um, no, I don't believe that that's the case and certainly that's not what's shown from um, some of the, uh, uh, the uh, work that has been done with the uh, AMP uh, advice network. And so what proportion of the AMP advice network is providing services in exchange for grandfathered commissions? I don't have a precise number uh, for that. Um, however, we have surveyed the, the network and uh, uh, have found that there is uh, a service being uh, given for uh, where uh, grandfathered commissions are, are being paid. And is the assumption that whatever that pool of advisors is would provide the same services for the same amount but just change it from a trail commission over to a fee for service? That would be uh, dependent on um, the arrangements that they reach with their, uh, with their customers. The reality is, isn't it, that a ban on grandfathered commissions would significantly affect AMP's business? Uh, there would be an impact on, on AMP's business, um, but um, that would not be a... Uh, uh, a reason that we would uh, we would oppose uh, uh, a, a, a total ban on uh, on grandfathering. Well, you you're now in favour of removing grandfathering, we're subject saying, to many qualifications. Yes, we're saying that there would be a, a necessary period of consultation with the industry and a period to allow um, uh, alternative arrangements to be uh, put in place. Nowhere in AMP's submission. Uh, Mr. Hodge, how long? You say a necessary period. How long? Commissioner, I, um, I think one year would be too short. Um, three years would probably be the, the maximum. Yes. Nowhere in AMP's submission to the interim report is there a recognition of the effect that trailing commissions can have on the financial position of the client? No, don't recall that it's, uh, 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 that it's in that, that submission, no. And the overall tenor of AMP's submission on grandfathered commissions is that, but for changed community sentiment, AMP would continue with grandfathered commissions? Well, the grandfathered commissions are paid by the product manufacturer uh, rather than, uh, uh, than by the, uh, uh, the client in, this, uh, in, in these scenarios. But AMP is running an advice business where it moved its advisors or supposedly moved its advisors to fees for service in 2010. Yes. And it still hasn't made the requirement, it required changes across its advisor network to move all of its practices away from grandfathered commissions onto fees for service. Well, it, it hasn't needed to do that because the commissions were grandfathered. And do you agree that trailing commissions 
are monies that are paid but are of no use to the client in the sense that they come with no contractual right on the part of the client to service? Uh, yes, the trail commission is paid by the product manufacturer. What would be beneficial to clients is if they're going to be paying amounts that they be paid for service. Yes. And when you say the trail commissions are paid by the product manufacturer, that's true in the sense that they are deducted by the product manufacturer from either the assets of the client or the premiums paid by the client? They, they would be built into the product pricing that the client has. But they're ultimately paid by the client? They're built into that, that uh, pricing that the client pays. And if trail commissions are ended, then logically the cost to the client would go down? Yes. So it's beneficial to the client to end trail commissions? Yes, where um, service is, is not being provided because in uh, other scenarios there would be an alternative arrangement needed to be put in place. Well, no, it must be beneficial because under the trail commission arrangement, as you keep saying, it's paid by the product manufacturer. There's no contractual right on the part of the client. Yes, but uh, where service is being provided for that uh, grandfathered commission, then the advisor would seek to put an alternative arrangement in place with, with the client at that time. And then the client would be better off because the client would pay a fee and receive a service. Well, the client would receive the, the equivalent service where it is being provided today, but the, the client would be the one paying the fee as opposed to the product manufacturer rebating it. In, in either world, the client pays the same amount of money? The, um, the fee is built into the, um, into the uh, product at the moment for where it is grandfathered. Where that would be um, removed, then there would be a separate arrangement put in place with the, with the client. I don't know whether the um, client would be better off or not, depending on the uh, size of what the commission is today relative to what the fee might <coughs> be uh, for the services being given. I, I'm just, I must say, this is an argument that I struggle to understand, which is the proposition that it is possible that there are Australians that are receiving more service than they are contractually entitled to, which is zero, when trail commissions are being paid than they would receive if they had a contractual entitlement to the service and were paying for it? I'm not suggesting that, Mr Hodge. What, I'm, what I am suggesting is that fees are being... Um, uh, being uh, Grandfathered commissions are being paid in lieu of, of fees from the, the uh, customer. And I can't tell you with precision whether the client would be better off if those uh, grandfathered commissions were turned off and it went to a uh, fee for uh, service arrangement with the customer because conceivably those fees could be greater than the grandfathered commission today. If the customer agrees to pay it. If the customer agrees to pay it. And if the customer it. doesn't agree to pay it, so be it. Yes. Yeah. That, surely you must agree, that is in the interests of consumers. Each, each um, consumer will have a different view uh, on this. We might switch to a different topic. Can we talk about the sale of your life business? As at October 2018, AMP was operating outside of its risk appetite for debt rating outlook, operational risk, profit at risk and reputational risk across all stakeholder groups? Uh, yes. And this was to be addressed by, among other things, Project Aqua and the Rebuilding Trust Program? Yes. Is it Project Aqua? Am I pronouncing that correctly? Uh, yes. Project Aqua is the sale of AMP's life business? Yes. 
and AMP announced the sale on 25 October 2018. Yes. And it's part of the plan for simpli simplification of AMP's wealth business. It, it is part of the uh, overall plan to uh, continue to invest in uh, those businesses where we see uh, greater growth and to uh, recycle capital from uh, those businesses uh, where we do not see that uh, opportunity. I see. You know that the chair of the AMP trustees met with APRA about the proposed sale in September of 2018? Um, I, I believe that's the case, yes. And are you aware that the chair of the trustees and APRA discussed that the transaction, that is the sale of the life business, will necessitate the replacement of the existing related party arrangements between the trustee and AMP Life as administrator? Uh, yes. And that APRA saw this as an opportunity for the trustees to refresh their approach to the related party arrangements, including benchmarking product offerings and related party arrangements generally, including performance monitoring? Um, I'm aware that that was discussed. In your statement, you say, for the products that are being transferred as part of the proposed sale, the trustee will be changed to a new trustee? Um, that's my understanding. And for those products, it is expected that AMP Life will continue as the administrator of those transferred products? Yes. And for the products that are retained by AMP, the trustees in conjunction with AMP will consider their options for the administration of these products? Yes. And if any part of the administration of these products is to be outsourced, this will occur in accordance with the trustees outsourcing policy? Yes. Does AMP yet know what are the transferred products and what are the retained products within superannuation? Uh, no, that is still being worked through. I see. Do you agree with APRA's view that the proposed sale represents an opportunity for the trustees to refresh their approach to related party arrangements? Um, the trustees will uh, look at the arrangements uh, through the uh, eyes of the, of the uh, members uh, and uh, will make the, uh, the, uh, their decision in uh, the best interest uh, of those members. One of the things you say in your statement is that the trustees will continue to be managed by strong and independent boards. Yes. Do we take it from that that you <coughs> see the trustee directors to date as having acted in a strong and independent way? Yes. You're aware that the AMP trustees recently reduced the administration costs on their generic life cycle, my super products, by 50%? Uh, by uh, approximately 50 basis points, yes. And, sorry, you're quite right, by approximately 50 basis points. And the fee reductions are now in effect? Yes. And they were significant reductions? Uh, yes. Um, and they, they were prompted by APRA having identified the poor performance of AMP's My Super products in October of 2017? Um, that was one of the uh, considerations. Um, I didn't personally have a conversation with the trustees to understand the, the full range of, uh, of considerations, but certainly um, there was a recognition uh, that um, the uh, fees were at the upper end of, uh, uh, of an appropriate scale. You're aware that there was an issue raised by APRA or a question raised by APRA in September of this year after the round five hearings about the fact that the AMP super trustee boards had not sought the reasoning for the proposed timetable for my super fee reductions? Um, personally, I'm not aware of that, Mr Hodge. You haven't been shown any document that records no, that? Not that I'm aware. I see. We might bring that up. Can we bring up AMP.6000.0343.0001? And if we go to page, sorry, I should just note, these are the board papers from the meeting of the board of AMP Limited, AMP Life Limited and NMLA. See that? Yes. 
And then if we go to page dot zero zero nine four. This actually we should go back a page just so you can see what this document is. So you see this is a letter sent by APRA to the chairman of the AMP trustees. Yes. And then if we go to the second page, you'll see what's recorded in that first bullet point after the first sentence. It was stated that the AMP super board had not sought the reasoning for the proposed timetable for my super fee reductions noting that APRA was advised there would be a nine month gap between the initial reduction in fees at end September 2018 and further fee reductions in June 2019. APRA expects that AMP Super will question the appropriateness of this and satisfy itself that this time frame is in members' best interests. Yes. Presumably that letter having come as part of the board pack for the board of AMP it's likely you would have seen that at some stage. Yes, I, I would have read the letter. And it seems implicit in that, what is said by APRA, that the trustee board had simply accepted the time frame put forward by the other part of AMP, rather than questioning itself what the time frame was for the fee reductions. Well, I, I wasn't part of the conversation, so I don't know what the, um, what the context of, of that statement uh, was. You're aware, though, of the evidence that was also given during round five about the approach of the AMP trustees? Broadly. Do you think, if you just take even just this point, that this is conduct that is consistent with a strong and independent board? Uh, I think that board is uh, certainly strong and uh, independent in the uh, way in which it um, looks after the interests of, uh, of the members um, uh, and uh, certainly part of that has been demonstrated through the uh, reduction in fees that have been affected to date. On a timetable determined by the product part of AMP's business? Well, there are uh, some times that uh, some lead times that need to be put in place uh, for these uh, for these uh, things to uh, uh, to take effect, without question by the AMP trustees. Well, I think the decision has to be uh, ultimately that of the uh, of the AMP trustees. But they haven't, you know, they haven't sought the reasoning for what the timetable is. That this is what's in that, that letter. I, as I said, I wasn't privy to the conversations with them. I see. Can I move then to another issue, which is. You tendering that? Uh, yes, I tender that document, Commissioner. Uh, minutes of the Board of AMP Limited, AMP Life and NMLA, 25 October 18, AMP 600343001, Exhibit 7.113. I want to move then to some issues in relation to risk frameworks. AM, well, it continues to be the case that AMP is exposed to what are described as a number of high residual risks. Yes. And one of those residual risks that was high, at least as at May 2018, is in relation to poor business practices and conduct. Yes. And if we bring up AMP.6000.0133.3737, we see this is the meeting papers for the concurrent meetings of the risk committees of AMP Limited, AMP Life, and NMLA. Yes. And if we go to page dot three seven five four, you see at the bottom of the page there's risk number eleven, which is clients, products, business practices, and conduct. Yes, and the nature of the risk is losses arising from poor business conduct. Yes, and the explanation of the key driver of the risk is poor, inappropriate or non-compliant advice, historical in the advice 
continues to be the biggest driver of this risk. AMP has the highest ratio of banned advisors to current advisors in the industry, 9% versus the next highest, 5% CBA. Yes. And this is a risk that has been residually high for several quarters. Yes. And do you have a view as to the extent to which or what it means that AMP has had to accept that risk? I think that we are talking here about the historic risks that, that are in place um, and uh, that risk um, is there for a, <coughs> excuse me, for a number of, uh, of reasons, um, including uh, uh, some of the uh, previous onboarding activities for advisors coming into the uh, AMP network as well as uh, some of the practices that they have been following. Uh, and the um, ineffective uh, risk processes and procedures that we've had in place uh, to monitor uh, the activities of those advisors. Is one of the issues with having adequate processes and procedures in place to monitor the activities of advisors that it costs a lot? Um, that would be one of the considerations, um, but it shouldn't be an overriding consideration. Is that, though, one of the reasons why investment in these processes and procedures has been deferred or not happened in the past because of the cost involved? Uh, I think there is uh, some evidence of the fact that we have preferred uh, short-term performance over making appropriate investments uh, for the longer term. However, um, with the announcement that you referred to earlier in July of this year, we did indicate that uh, over the course of the next two years, we would be spending $100 million to improve the uh, risk governance processes and procedures. Uh, and obviously the advice business will be part of where that, that money is uh, directed. And the hope, I assume, is that by spending that money, you can be more confident that the quality of advice provided to customers will be good? Yes, we have also uh, enhanced the audit processes and some of the other processes within the advice business already and I think we're starting to see some of the benefits of that coming through in terms of the, um, uh, the fail rates uh, for uh, those advisors who have been uh, subject more recently to the revised audit processes. <coughs> One of the other areas in which AMP has accepted. Just before you leave this area, Mr Hodge, uh, do you have any view, uh, Mr Wilkins, about how the industry generally or the law generally should deal with the problem of the so-called rolling bad apple? That is the advisor who uh, is uh, not sufficiently competent or engages in conduct of a kind that the advice licensee uh, condemns uh, moves from business to business? Uh, Commissioner, I think that there uh, should be uh, more protocols uh, for that in place. AMP was an early adopter of the ABA protocols around uh, recognising that, and I think that that's an appropriate protocol. Um, Is it sufficient? I mean, it, it, yes. I understand how you say it helps. Is it a sufficient step? I think it, uh, it is a sufficient step, but um, there also needs to be um, uh, better uh, monitoring um, of the activities of those advisors and a, uh, a quicker consequence uh, uh, from organisations where those advisors uh, are not meeting the appropriate standards. Do you have any view on whether uh, individual licensing is uh, simply a bureaucratic step too far or a useful step? Um, I, I think that um, it probably would, would be a, uh, an overly bureaucratic step to, to go with that. I think that the licensees do accept responsibility for, their, uh, for those uh, advisors who are, li are aligned with their licence and it comes the down Act to... The tells them they've got to, yes. yes. 
Um, yes, but uh, I, I think that uh, uh, my view, personal view, is uh, yes, it probably would be an overly bureaucratic step to require uh, individual licensing, and then it's a question of who would, would license them and how the, um, the uh, responsibilities would then sit uh, around the activities of those individuals. Yes. Why is that though? Why is it overly bureaucratic? If financial advisors are to be a profession, and in other professions you're licensed individually by whatever the relevant regulatory body is. Uh, yes, but you are usually then not also uh, aligned and licensed with a, uh, with a, uh, a licensee. Uh, so uh, I guess I'm talking here about a, um, uh, a, a self-enforcement uh, program as opposed to, to one that is driven by a, um, an individual uh, licence. Plus I think that um, the industry is becoming more professional and that the educational standards that, uh, that are required will see a, an uplift in terms of the, the overall professionalism uh, here as well. I'm just trying to understand though, AMP supports the professionalisation of financial advisors? Yes. Why wouldn't financial advisors, if they're to be professionals, be like every other professional, why wouldn't they be like doctors and engineers and lawyers and accountants? That is, they have an individual licensing and they have a regulatory body that is responsible specifically for disciplining them. Um, there's no significant difference in that. Um, I think it's a, a question of, of whether um, uh, the outcome sought can be achieved through, uh, through a different means. And in response to the uh, Commissioner's question, uh, it was around individual licensing. And as I said, my personal view is uh, uh, that's probably uh, uh, an overly bureaucratic step at this time. Can we deal then with one of the other risks we were going to talk about? Oh, I'm sorry, I should tender that document, Commissioner. Uh, risks committee uh, meeting papers, uh, AMP Limited, AMP Life, NMLA, 8 May 18, AMP 6000-0133-3737, Exhibit 7.114. Another risk I wanted to ask you about, Mr Wilkins, that is now coming home for AMP is in relation to the client servicing model for its workplace for AMP's workplace super plans. That's not on the screen. We can take that down. Are you familiar with an issue around the client servicing model? Um, broadly, but not specifically. You're aware that following FOFA, AMP introduced the client servicing model to maintain the service proposition for members who would no longer be paying servicing fees to advisors? Uh, yes. And one of the things that AMP accepted was the residual risk that the client servicing model would contravene FOFA? Um, uh, I saw that in a, uh, a tender bundle that was, uh, uh, was submitted to me a couple of days ago. Uh, said, that was I'll, the first I'll, time I was aware of it. I'll bring it up to make sure we're talking about the same thing. Can we bring up AMP.6000.0019.1499? So this is a pack for the AFS leadership team. And if we go to page.1583, this is a memorandum <coughs> in relation to seeking formal approval from the Australian Financial Services leadership team to accept the residual risk that the client servicing model remuneration for corporate super may be considered to be conflicted remuneration? Yes. And you're aware then from the documents you've seen that the AFSLT accepted that risk? Uh, yes. And I tender that document, Commissioner. AFS leadership team papers 1 November 13, AMP 6000-0019-1499, Exhibit 7.115. And 
are you aware then from the documents that you've looked at that the trustees, the superannuation trustees were told to note the new arrangements in a memorandum? Um, that's my recollection of the, uh, well, uh, they, they were asked to note the, uh, the new arrangements as opposed to told to. Yes, they weren't, they weren't told though about the risk of conflicted remuneration? I, I don't know the answer right. to that question. You're aware that AMP is currently conducting a detailed historical service review of the fees, of the plan service fees charged for employer plans since 2008? Yes. And an initial and high level assessment has indicated that there are policy and control gaps in the management and monitoring of fees charged to workplace super members and for fees received by AMP advisors? Uh, yes. And AMP has identified eight incidents as at 17 October 2018 with respect to charging of planned service fees and provision of services? Uh, yes, those are being uh, investigated uh, at the moment. And they've been breach reported to the regulator? Um, I'm not aware that they've... Uh, the regulator has been made aware of that, I beg your pardon. And AMP is urgently sampling tests... I'm sorry, urgently sampling members to test whether services were provided? Yes. And currently conducting a workplace super compliance framework project? Yes. And that project is seeking to assess whether for both the trustees and the AFSL holders' obligations, there are effective processes, controls and reporting in place for governance, outsourcing management, monitoring and supervision of workplace super fees and services? Yes. Is the risk that AMP faces in relation to this that it may have another fees for no service case on its hands? Yes. And do you have a view as to how it is that AMP has allowed itself and its trustees to be exposed to this risk? Um, I, I don't have a view. We're still going through the, the process of understanding um, this. Um, the paper you're referring to was uh, to bring the matter to the attention of the board, um, which uh, we felt was appropriate in the circumstances. PwC is conducting a review of AMP's corporate superannuation governance controls and processes, or it may have already done it. it, it I think it is conducting it. And that report, though, is said by AMP to be subject to legal professional privilege, is that right? Um, my understanding. Now, AMP Limited owns AMP Bank. Yes. And AMP Bank is a medium ADI for the purposes of the Banking Act. Yes. And therefore, the bare obligations will apply to it from 1 July 2019. Yes. And AMP had considered several, I think, three different models of accountability to apply to Bear. <coughs> and one of those models, the one that was ultimately adopted, is the hybrid model. Yes. And that model and the individuals identified in it as accountable persons were approved by the AMP Bank Board on the 2nd of May 2018 don't recall the date but it's yes. been approved yes and the accountability model i might just bring it up if we bring up amp.6000.0346.0495 we see this is a memorandum for the bear steering committee yes dated the 16th of march 2018 Yes. And if we go to page dot zero five zero zero. You see what the steering committee was asked to approve is the hybrid accountability model. Yes. And the working group's view is that this model is a more flexible and pragmatic approach in meeting AMP's long-term strategic goals and shared services model as it can be dialed up or down depending on regulatory and organisational changes. Yes. And it's explained that adopting a purely bank level option or group level option for accountable persons is less efficient 
more disruptive to the current operating rhythm and may not meet the longer term strategy of AMP Group? Yes. And it appears that the working group and ultimately the steering committee was accepting disruption or the problem of disruption as a significant reason to go with hybrid accountability rather than the other two models? Um, I, I think that that is mentioned here, but my understanding is that it was um, looking to make sure that it, it uh, recognised where people who should be accountable uh, sat within the organisation given the shared services model that uh, AMP operates. Well, all three models would have been in compliance with BEAR? Yes. And the particular issue that was identified in the memorandum for the steering committee was that it would be less efficient and more disruptive to go with one of the other two models rather than the hybrid model? Uh, yes, it was felt, I think, that the hybrid model was a, uh, a more appropriate model given the, uh, the structure and where services were provided uh, from within the AMP group. Do you think, from your perspective, the implementation of BEAR might have been an opportunity for AMP to reassess the design of its organisation and accountability? Um, I think that uh, AMP uh, has chosen the operating model that it, it currently does, whereby um, some services are provided uh, centrally, others are provided within uh, specific business units, and what it's tried to do is to make sure that it's identified those accountable persons under the, the bare uh, requirements, uh, regardless of where they sit within the structure of, uh, within the corporate structure of AMP. What it sounds though, what it sounds like though, is that rather than taking this as an opportunity to think about and restructure the organisation of AMP, that the bear model that's been adopted is one that's fitted to what is least likely to disrupt the existing organisation within AMP. I think the, um, the process would have looked at all of the alternatives as this, um, as this paper shows, but um, it also um, has considered the structure that, uh, that the uh, organisation has chosen to, to follow, which has uh, some services provided centrally, others provided within the individual business unit, and I, I think that's, a, that's a, an appropriate decision for a, a business the size of AMP. Does it suggest that in respect of an organisation like, like AMP that uh, engages in a number of different financial services, that there would be advantage in having an accountability regime that was not restricted to banking? Um, yes, uh, uh, and uh, in fact with some of the, um, uh, the requirements for uh, the bare uh, accountabilities and more particularly the remuneration parts of that, we've already made the decision that we will extend that, uh, that particularly the deferral timeframes uh, across uh, all of the organisation rather than just to the bank. And apart from... Uh, the remuneration consequences which have their particularly important part to play in BEAR, uh, just accountability mapping and accountability statements. Uh, are those steps that would have value uh, in AMP uh, in its activities beyond banking, say into its superannuation activities, say, well, uh, depending... There's now not much left of the insurance activities, is there? Uh, but into the super activities? Uh, yes, there would be uh, benefit from that, and I think some of the overseas models where similar arrangements have been put in place apply to, uh, to broader areas of, of conglomerates. Yes. If you think, though, about the organisational design governance model and risk management controls for AMP, this has been a problem for AMP, hasn't it? 
for several years? I'm sorry. I'm the sorry. The, the organisational design, governance model and risk management controls are things that have been problematic for AMP for a few years. Well, certainly the um, uh, risk management controls and governance, um, there have been issues with that. And as I mentioned earlier, I think part of that has been that there's been an underspend uh, over <coughs> the past several years on, on those processes and procedures. EY performed the most recent triennial review of the AMP group in accordance with CPS 220. And that's my understanding. And that was done in 2015 before you joined the company? Yes and another one hasn't occurred yet? No. And EY delivered its report or delivered a report dated the 2nd of March 2016? Uh, that is my understanding. You've looked at that report? Yes. And EY benchmarked AMP Group, AMP Life and AMP Bank against its peers? Yes. And all three benchmarked as low compared to their peers? On some sectors, uh, in, in some areas, they were uh, equivalent to their peers, I think. In respect of the group, EY found that as an Australian conglomerate, AMP is trailing behind its peers in the benchmarked attributes utilised. Yes. And EY said that work was needed across the AMP group to lift the capability and quality of the risk management framework to align with industry peers, reasonable practice for risks under management and developments in conglomerate risk management? Yes. And EY made a number of recommendations to improve or repair the enterprise risk management framework? Yes. And AMP has been working to implement those arrangements since 2016? Yes. APRA made the observation in April 2015 that whilst APRA notes the ongoing work to enhance the maturity and effectiveness of the enterprise risk management framework, it is our view that overall the framework is not at a level appropriate to the size, complexity and business mix of the group. Yes. And an internal report, internal audit report prepared in February of this year noted that management acknowledged that further action is required across the six enterprise risk management framework components to create a risk management framework that is commensurate to the size and complexity of AMP? Yes. And so, again, to return to my question about the implementation of BEAR, why implement BEAR in a way that preserves the processes, systems and controls that AMP has in place or doesn't disrupt them? Um, I, I think that BEAR needs to be um, implemented in a way that also works for the organisation. Um, AMP is uh, on a journey in terms of what it is looking to do um, uh, with its uh, risk processes uh, and controls. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we're making a considerable investment in enhancing that, um, that there will be benefit to the bank from that as they will to the uh, rest of the AMP group. Under the hybrid model, the CEO is not an account. The CEO of AMP group is not an accountable person. Yes. If you'd adopted the group model, would the CEO have been an accountable person? Um, I, I can't recall the, the what what that was shown in the uh, in the paper, uh, but um, in in theory, yes. Well, I can bring it up if it helps. Can we, Commissioner, I attend to that document? Oh, I'm sorry, I, we should go to page dot zero five zero one. So you see, this is the group level accountability model. Yes. And so under the group level model, you can see the then group CEO would have been an accountable person. Yes. And again, I wonder why not take the step if you think BEAR is a good idea and the extension of BEAR is a good idea to adopt that group level accountability model for AMP? Um, 
can't comment on the on the specific decision, obviously before my time uh, there. However, we will certainly comply with um, with the uh, with whatever legislation uh, is put in place. And um, the commissioner has raised a, a good question around whether it, it should apply to <coughs> conglomerate uh, entities. Is that a convenient time? I'm oh, sorry, I tend to that document. I tend to that. The memorandum bear steering committee 16 March 18 AMP 6000 exhibit 7.116. Commissioner, just before we rise, can I just clarify one thing, which is, I think I asked a question earlier where I referred Mr Wilkins to a breach notification having been given on the 17th of October 2018, when it should have been 2016. I think you gave me a quizzical look yes. at that point, That's which I, I said think was I, because I, you picked it up. I, I said I wasn't aware of one going yes. at that stage. Thank you. Now, timing, Mr Hodge, what, one, what time tomorrow? and. Two, that's affected by how much longer you expect to require with Mr Wilkins, do you think? Commissioner, I'd be content to start at 10. I think I'll have cut this down to be finished with Mr Wilkins within half an hour tomorrow morning. But we could start at 9.45 if you'd prefer. I think 10 a.m. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes. Can you be back in time to begin at 10 a.m., please, Mr Wilkins? Yes, Commissioner. Yes, 10 a.m. Yes, Mr. Hunt. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Wilkins, I wanted to ask you some questions about a document that was sent to you, a memorandum from Melanie Howard MacDonald, who is the AMP customer advocate. Yes. And I'll bring that up. That's AMP.6000.0287.4832. So this is a memorandum that Ms Howard MacDonald prepared and provided to you setting out her thoughts in relation to the CBA Prudential inquiry? Yes. And was that a document that you asked her to prepare? This was one of a series of documents that I asked the top 100 leaders of AMP to uh, prepare. Um, I felt that it was important to get their perspective immediately after the CBA report had been uh, produced and um, not everyone um, uh, provided me their views, but uh, quite a number did. Uh, Ms uh, Howard MacDonald was one of those. And ultimately, were any of these views passed on to the rest of the board? Um, uh, they were in, in broad terms uh, and have been uh, used uh, as the... Uh, basis for some of the hypotheses that were developed as we were um, uh, preparing our own response um, to, uh, to APRA in respect of that CBA report. I see. What I thought it might be helpful for us to do is if I just take you to some parts of Ms Howard MacDonald's observations and then ask you what your view is about these particular points. So if we go to the second page. You see the second full paragraph from the top says, however, while a clear pathway has been identified as a bare minimum to be followed by AMP, affecting real change will take time and require a degree of honesty and frankness about deliberate choices, behaviours and practices that have previously been viewed as acceptable within AMP and what is required to change them. Yes. And what seems implicit in that is that in the past there has not been the necessary degree of honesty and frankness about particular choices and behaviours that have been made within AMP? Um, that's the, the implication from that um, paragraph. I think um, this whole document needs to be uh, viewed in the light of, uh, of the role that <coughs> Ms Howard MacDonald plays, which is as customer advocate dealing with customer complaints on a day-by-day uh, -day basis. But I did say uh, yesterday that uh, I felt that uh, it was important that uh, at AMP we set the standards of, uh, of behaviour and that um, uh, uh, 
uh, and that there were consequences around those standards of behaviour and that uh, previously we hadn't enforced that. Um, so I, I take that as consistent with, with that view. Yes, I think the point you were making yesterday was whatever the ethical failings within the business in the past, you wanted to make very clear now what the standards of behaviour were that were expected within AMP and make sure that that flowed down throughout the organisation. Yes. And then the second part of that page that I wanted to draw your attention to is you see there's a heading AMP customer advocate actions to be taken and the first bullet point under that is ensuring that the customer voice and the risk and legal voice are equal with the financial voice in decision making. This is a very simple statement but essentially means redefining our strategic operational and product service design decision making processes and forums to ensure these voices are explicitly incorporated and given equal weight. Do you have a view about, and we'll start with the past, whether in the past the voice on behalf of the customer and the voice of risk and legal has been treated equally with the financial voice? Uh, I think in the, in the past we, we have preferred short-term performance over uh, some longer-term investment and, and other actions that uh, need to be taken. And have you formed a view about how you change that? Uh, I think that it's, uh, it, it uh, is and, and has changed um, during, uh, certainly during my tenure in that um, uh, we have uh, sought to uh, consider the, uh, the position of the, of the customer in uh, a number of the major decisions that we've taken and also uh, we have uh, ensured that uh, any of those major decisions have had the, uh, uh, the voice of, of risk through the chief risk officer involved. Uh, one of the things that we uh, did do as an organisation is said that we were going to um, set some objectives for ourselves for this six months uh, uh, until the end of this year um, and uh, finance, uh, customer, uh, uh, risk and in fact all other uh, key areas of the organisation were involved in, in setting that. One of those objectives uh, was to uh, uh, make sure that we actually uh, considered customers, that we uh, got on with the remediation program that we discussed yesterday, uh, but also that we, uh, uh, we continue to improve our processes and systems uh, around that. So I, I think that it has been considered. When you talk about improving your processes and systems, I just want to understand that a little bit. You would know, I'm sure, that a lot of the other or some of the other major entities that have come before the Commission this year have emphasised that they have made particular changes to their three lines of defence and in particular that they've tried to strengthen their second line of defence in particular ways, that they've tried to improve their first line of defence's understanding of risk, that is improve the business's understanding of risk, that they've tried to increase reporting in relation to risk so it rises up through the organisation. Are those the types of changes to systems and processes that you're talking about? Uh, yes, partially. Um, and certainly that's um, a, a good portion of the uh, $100 million that we have said we're going to, uh, uh, to spend over the next two years to, uh, uh, to reinforce our, our risk uh, processes uh, and procedures and systems. And is the aim of that to make sure that when problems occur, they're quickly recognised and escalated within the business? That's the first thing? That's, that's part of it, but also making sure that there are pr processes and pr procedures in place that hopefully get to those problems before, or get to those issues before they, uh, uh, they become problems, which comes through the first line. Yes, I understand. So first, that the first line of defence actually recognises the issue and doesn't behave in a way that creates the problem in the first place. That's the hope. Yes. And then improve the second line of defence and also improve risk reporting generally so that if something has become a problem or if an issue is emerging and isn't being addressed by the business, it's recognised by the second line of defence or it's recognised by more senior executives. Yes, if the problems are, are called out, <coughs> escalated more quickly and, and hopefully dealt with more quickly. And then from the top, 
set the tone about when an issue is recognised, what the correct ethical behaviour is. Yes. Um, uh, one of the things that I've said is when issues arise, um, uh, we should acknowledge those issues, we should actually um, uh, fix those issues, we should learn from those issues, and then we should move forward. If we come over to the next page, there's a heading which is 1AMP, and you'll see the first sentence under that heading says, as a business we talk often about the value of a vertically integrated business, but in practice my feeling is that we have little organisational understanding of what this means in terms of customer and other stakeholder expectations. And then there's a, the next sentence says, further on a day-to-day -day basis, we operate as broadly four separate business lines who happen to share the same name and spend a lot of time doing business with each other, sometimes to the detriment of customer outcomes. And perhaps if we start by just understanding what the four separate business lines are that Ms Howard MacDonald is talking about. Presumably one is advice, one is insurance, one is product manufacture, and... And the, and the fourth is investment. And the fourth is investment. And do you share her view that the understanding of vertical integration within AMP is problematic? Uh, no, I don't. Um, I think that, that that is her view uh, seen through the lens of the, uh, of the customer advocate um, and in uh, dealing with, with issues as they arise um, and uh, some of the difficulties that she may be encountering in trying to go cross business unit to, to deal with those, uh, with those customer issues. Her perspective is the perspective of the customer and a very particular perspective of the customer, which is customers who are making complaints. Yes. And from the perspective of the customer making complaints, she sees problems with the vertically integrated model. I think she was having some problems in terms of navigating some parts of the business to get information that she was uh, looking for, um, which may have prompted some of that discussion. I see. We might come back to vertical integration in a moment. Can we go over to the next page, which is dot 4835? And you'll see there's a heading which is expectations are not optional. And the first sentence says, the other element that I believe we need to consider as we embark on our rebuilding efforts is that we seem as an organisation not to be comfortable with setting expectations for people and holding them to account. It seems to go against our cultural DNA. Now, I think you've made the point yesterday that since you have been in the role of acting CEO, you've focused on trying to make sure that expectations are understood and that there are consequences where people step outside of the expectations. Yes. Do you think, though, that Ms Howard MacDonald is right to say that in the past, the cultural DNA of AMP didn't support that type of idea? Um, I don't know that I'd describe it as cultural DNA. I, I do think that there were um, uh, examples and, and potentially uh, several examples where people were not uh, appropriately held to account for, um, for inappropriate behaviour. I see. And that failure to hold people to account is presumably something that has to start at the very top. That is, at the very top, people are not holding their subordinates to account for their misbehaviour. I think it needs to go right through the organisation. It's the only way in which you can, um, uh, you can get people to recognise that they do need to be doing the right thing and that there are consequences where they don't do that right thing. And do you have confidence that once you finish at the end of this week that the change that you have tried to bring about will continue and be embedded within the organisation? Uh, as confident as I can be, Mr Hodge, um, um, these things always uh, move, but uh, having had discussions with the incoming CEO, I know that he shares similar views uh, to me, and in fact he has said that to uh, the broader staff as well, that uh, he will be expecting to, uh, people to be accountable.
do you think that one of the reasons that you could recognise the problem and that perhaps it hadn't been recognised in the past is that you come from outside AMP? Oh, look, I, I don't know the, the, the particular answer to that. Um, just felt that it was appropriate to say that, that we have to set some standards and we have to hold ourselves accountable for those standards. If we go over the page to page.4837. You see at the bottom of the page, Ms Howard MacDonald expresses some views about board and senior leadership. And I just want to ask you about the last sentence on that page which says it could be open to characterise some decisions made by the board over the past five years during the strategic planning process as at times setting the tone of a willingness to accept elements of heightened customer and conduct risk in order to maintain short-term financial performance and consideration should now be, should be given to how these perceptions can be balanced. Do you share that view as to the decision making of the board over the last five years? Well, I think there's, there's always trade-offs that have to be made in um, terms of any decisions that are made, particularly big strategic decisions. Um, the important thing is that all, um, all uh, particular aspects are, are considered during that. However, um, I said yesterday and I've said again this morning that um, there have been some instances where we've preferred shorter term performance outcomes to uh, longer term investment and, uh, uh, and longer term outcomes. And that's a preference though, not just within the GLT, but also in the past at the board level? Well, the board has, has um, uh, signed off on the, uh, on the strategy that's been put forward by the, uh, by the business. Whether uh, we were as aware um, as perhaps we needed to be in terms of what those explicit trade-offs uh, is difficult to, to say. I see. If we go over the page to dot 4840, you see the second or the first complete paragraph at the top of the page says, conduct, conduct risk needs an intense level of scrutiny as episodes of misconduct can cause serious damage to AMP's reputation and undermine the confidence of customers and other stakeholders. And then Ms. Mac Ms. Howard MacDonald goes on to say, AMP should consider establishing a formal conduct risk strategy. And has AMP established a formal conduct risk strategy? Uh, no, we haven't uh, at this stage. And is that something you've thought about? Uh, it's part of the consideration that, uh, uh, that is going into um, what uh, happens at AMP. One of the things that um, we have wanted to do is to, uh, before making uh, very broad changes, is to allow the new chief executive to come into, uh, into place um, so that uh, uh, he is the one that is actually setting that, that standard and deciding uh, where he wants to go. However, um, I think we are well aware of the uh, uh, of uh, that episodes of misconduct can cause serious reputational damage, and uh, whilst there mightn't be a, uh, uh, a particular strategy around it, I, I think we're we're very conscious of uh, of reputational issues. Attend to that document, Commissioner. A memorandum of AMP customer advocate to Mr. Wilkins for June 18, AMP 6000. Uh, 0287 4832 exhibit 7.117. Mr. Wilkins, the last topic I want to turn to. Just before we depart from that matter, uh, Mr. Hodge, uh, Mr. Wilkins, you said at the uh, uh, annual general meeting of the company in May this year that, uh, and I think I quote you accurately, uh, a small number of individuals in our advice business made the decision not to follow policy and inappropriately charged fees to customers where no service was provided. Do you regard that as a proper characterisation of what happened? Uh, yes, I do, Commissioner. A few bad apples. 
Uh, yes, and, uh, that was uh, part of the, uh, uh, the subject of, uh, uh, of my uh, witness statement uh, around uh, the fact that um, policies were in place, that fees were, were to be turned off, those policies were not followed, and uh, there have been subsequent consequences for those people who, um, who didn't follow that policy. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr Wilkins, the last topic I wanted to ask you some questions about is vertical integration and how the AMP business model fits with changes that are happening and have happened. And it may be useful to do this by reference to a memorandum that you prepared for the board. Can we bring up AMP.6000.0329.0254? So this is the board pack for the meeting of the concurrent meeting of the three boards on 21 June 2018. Yes. And if we go to page.0273, we see a memorandum that you prepared to the board with the subject strategic response context and framing. Yes. And as you explain, or as is explained in that paper, the purpose of it is to provide the board with a view of how the issues and uncertainties in the current environment may impact the chosen, chosen strategy for AMP and the core strategic questions that will need to be answered over the coming months to inform and shape our beliefs and strategy. Yes. And I think it fair to say you haven't given up on vertical integration. No. And for AMP, at least as it stands, Vertical integration is pretty fundamental to the business. We, we believe in um, vertical integration. We think it's, uh, uh, it's a, a, an appropriate uh, structure uh, that does have benefits for the consumer as well. Well, if we go to page.0279. <coughs> and can we blow up what's termed exhibit one at the top? So this is explaining some aspects of AMP's vertically integrated business model. And I just want to make sure we've understood how this fits together. On the left-hand side, we see the customer. Yes. And then the customer is then works through the various distribution channels that AMP has. Yes. And the principal distribution channel is advice and, the di and either direct or aligned advisors. Yes. And then we see what's set out there is, I, I think the percentages are what percentages of the customers' choices are going into A&P products. Yes. And we can see very high for platforms and then goes down through funds, risk and bank. Yes. And you see at the top of the page, there's a red number two, which is for margin share. Yes. And it says there's a $370 million margin share. Yes. Could you just explain to the commissioner what that means? Um, <clears throat> that is a payment that comes from the uh, manufacturing units to the uh, advice uh, unit, recognising the access to um, to all of those forms of uh, of advice in terms of the um, uh, in terms of the product flows that uh, uh, potentially come to AMP. Is it? And tell me if I'm right about this. Is it the case that 330 million dollars in commissions is paid by the products over to advice. Yes. And 
$370 million is the amount of the margin that these AMP products make from the customers that is then shared back to the advisors. Yes, through through access to, to that advice network. Sorry, there's the, the $330 million of commissions forms part of the $370 million margin share? Um, uh, I think that that is uh, separate. I would have to read the whole document, Mr Hodge, to re-familiarise myself with it. <coughs> All right. And we can see then what's also depicted is the value of funds that are flowing through these from the customers through the AMP distribution channel of its advisors and into its various products. Yes. And then in turn, at least from a number of those products, those products then flow on over to AMP Capital, who is the investment manager. Yes. And it appears as if the majority of the funds that AMP Capital manages comes out of the AMP products. Um, yes, ha however, I, I think that in that situation you need to look through um, AMP Capital because it then actually allocates those funds to a number of other um, external managers um, so that the, that um, particular diagram as, as it sits showing internal funds, yes, they, they are from internal sources but they then um, uh, potentially flow out to other external fund managers as well. Yes, but the majority of funds that AMP Capital brings in and then distributes out to other fund managers comes from AMP products. Yes. And then if we then look, move away from Exhibit 1 and look at the bottom of the page, there's a paragraph that begins vertical integration. And this explains a little further some other aspects of the vertically integrated model for AMP and says vertical integration means second and third order impacts may propagate throughout multiple business units, both upstream and downstream in the value chain. For example, if grandfathered commissions were reduced, this would reduce costs to wealth management, which may be passed to customer through price reductions, may reduce advisor practice profitability and lead to increased exercising of BOLA and potentially decrease the profitability of practice finance funded by AMP Bank. Yes. And so just to take the very last point, one of the consequences of advisors exiting the AMP network, or no longer being AMP aligned advisors, might be that they would no longer be borrowing money from AMP in order to fund their practices or the purchase of their practices. Yes. Now, what I, then want to test with you is how this vertically integrated model fits in a world where advisors are not a distribution network for products. Because I think we agreed yesterday when we were talking about it that going back more than 10 years that's what advisors were. They were paid a commission by the product manufacturer because they were distributing the product manufacturer's products. Yes. And the fundamental shift that has occurred, as we discussed yesterday, is that they are no longer to be a distribution network for the products. They are to be professionals acting in the interests of their clients and if they happen to recommend any particular product, it's supposed to be not because they're aligned with that product, but because they think that's in the best interest of their customers. Yes. And under the old model, it may have at least appeared on its face as if there was no conflict of interest for the advisor because the advisor wasn't really purporting to act in the best interests of the customer, or at least not primarily in the best interests of the customer. They were purporting to be a distribution network and they were paid money by the product manufacturer to do that. Yes, and going back far enough in, in um, 
the insurance industry, those advisors were agents of the, of the company and, and in fact tied to only being able to distribute the company's products. Yes. And the conflict of interest has arisen because the nature of what an advisor is doing has either been, on one view, changed, or on another view, clarified and given crystal clarity, which is they're not a distribution network, they're providing advice to the client. Yes, they, they have a, a best interest duty to the client. That's right. And that then, that complete change in the nature of what they are doing is what has created the situation of conflict for them, conflict between their own interests and the interests of the client when they're in a vertically integrated group. Well, I think in, in any um, situation, regardless of whether they're in a vertically integrated group or whether they are um, uh, totally independent, I, I think there is still the potential for, for conflict in that scenario. Um, uh, advisors do have a, a best interest obligation and I don't think that it, it naturally follows that uh, they do not exercise that best interest obligation if they're in a verti vertically integrated group or that the risk of them not doing that is any less if they are in an independent role. I think we're talking about two different things. The point that I'm making to you is there wasn't a conflict to be managed for the advisor if the advisor was never purporting to act for the client, they were only purporting to distribute the product manufacturer's products. Yes, I accept that. And it's the change in the nature of their role that has led to the conflict. Yes, or potential conflict. Potential, well, it's, it's always a conflict. The question is how they manage it. And the difficulty then for an organisation like AMP is that it would seem the vertically integrated business model made sense when advisors were a distribution network for products and those products then fed into the investment management business. Yes, although I, I still think that it makes sense um, in, in today's world <coughs> as well. And why is that? Well, I think there are a number of advantages that, that vertical integration uh, does present, including from a, a customer point of view. Um, uh, and some of those are <coughs> outlined in my witness statement, but um, they, they range around um, uh, affordability of advice because of the, um, the greater scale that's, a, that's afforded and that uh, uh, advice uh, networks or, or the administration of advice networks can have its fixed costs spread over a, a broader um, <coughs> cost base. Um, I, I think that there are um, uh, benefits to be uh, had also in, uh, in terms of um, uh, just the uh, comfort and confidence that uh, customers can have uh, in dealing with a large um, integrated organisation, uh, knowing that that organisation will stand behind the uh, uh, the uh, advice and, and the uh, any and remedy any issues uh, that uh, that may emerge. And the third thing is, I think that there's a a feedback loop that's a, that's available that is to the benefit of the customer ultimately through. Um, the feedback that the advisors get around the appropriateness of the, of the products that are in the marketplace at the moment that they can then feed back into the product manufacturing component to make sure that those products are, uh, are, are contemporary and, uh, and meeting the, uh, uh, the needs of, of the customers. Can we take those things in reverse order? To begin with the feedback loop, Presumably, independent, unaligned advisors who could also put their customers into AMP products? Um, if, if they are uh, uh, on, on an accepted list, yes. I'm sorry, so... If, if, if they're on, a, if they're on a, an approved product list, if the, AM, <coughs> excuse me, if the AMP <coughs> products are on, a, on an approved list, yes, they could. Yes, a AMP will welcome funds coming from independent advisors. Yes those advisors or the people preparing their approved products list, approved product lists may or may not think that the AMP products are good for their customers. Yes. 
And if they don't think they're good for their customers, then they won't put it on their approved product lists. Yes. And therefore, they might not put their clients into those products. But assuming they think the products are any good, then they could put their clients into those products. Yes. And presumably, if there were problems that they identified with AMPs, platforms or systems or products, those advisors would give feedback to AMP. Yes. And you would expect independent financial advisors acting in the interests of their clients to be putting upstream pressure on the product manufacturers about the quality of their products. Yes, in theory. Sorry? In theory. Well, I'm just wondering then, in theory, why it is that the feedback loop is dependent in any way on vertical integration? I, I didn't say it was totally dependent on vertical integration. I, I think the, uh, uh, the ability for those aligned advisors to uh, understand how to navigate the organisation a little bit better means that their voice is probably going to be more easily and more quickly heard than, uh, uh, than those independent advisors. Yes, although the flip side of that might be that the thing that will be heard the loudest by any product manufacturer is a flow of funds away from that product manufacturer. Certainly, uh, all product manufacturers, and I think, uh, uh, monitor what their product flows are. And one might well think that independent advisors are more likely to move their clients away from a product that they don't think is any good if they have or are not aligned with the product manufacturer? Uh, I don't think that that necessarily follows. Um, I, I think that um, aligned advisors still do have that best interest duty uh, and need to, uh, if, if they are finding that, uh, uh, say, an AMP product does not uh, meet the needs of their uh, client, then they would, look to, um, they would look to do something about that. Although that may well depend on whether AMP has put any alternative products on the approved product list. Uh, AMP's got quite a, uh, a sizeable approved <coughs> product list, um, uh, which uh, I, I think is demonstrated by um, that uh, previous slide that you showed, where there was uh, 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 a, a number of, uh, uh, of areas where AMP's flows were less than 50 per cent of the uh, uh, from the uh, aligned network. Sorry, just to get, can we just bring up Exhibit One because this is a very interesting point. I think somebody looking at that, an independent person might, looking at those percentages, might think, once you exclude bank, that they're quite extraordinary, that they are, that a genuinely independent advisor facing the extraordinary range of wealth management products available in Australia and overseas just could not possibly be putting that percentage of their clients' funds into AMP products if they are acting in the best interests of their clients. I think you need to look at some of the um, issues, particularly uh, around the platform uh, uh, business, um, because uh, that would represent the uh, amount of product that was uh, on an AMP platform, but then similar to what I described with AMP Capital, there would be a look through to what the, what the actual underlying investments are that uh, sit with that. And I think that number would come down quite considerably <coughs> from where it, it currently sits if, if the look through was applied. Oh, I see. You'll, well, ignore platform, in fact, ignore risk and ignore bank and just think about funds. Is the point you're making, it might look as if 65% of the funds under management coming through AMP financial planning is going into AMP products, but in fact, ultimately, it's flowing out of those AMP products into other products. There, there would be some of that flowing out. Some would be staying with AMP for management. I'm not sure that really, in the end, addresses the question, because presumably an independent advisor would think if this is ultimately going to be going into Arrow Street Global Management, then we'll just put it straight into Arrow Street Global Management rather than running it through another A&P product. It, it, it depends on what the uh, uh, the approved product list were, and I'm not sure whether Arrow Street's on our uh, list or not. 
let's move then to the second point in reverse order, which was confidence. And the point that you made was a client coming to AMP would have confidence that AMP will stand behind the advice. Yes. And one thing that you imagine might dent their confidence is the fact that, at least as at the beginning of this year, AMP was seriously contemplating the possibility that they might still be remediating a client 17 years after they'd been charged fees for no service? Uh, yes, but uh, as, as I explained yesterday, at that stage I don't think we had a, um, a full appreciation of the size of the issue that we were facing. And um, in terms of uh, the subsequent provisions that we have put forward, I think we're, we are facing into that problem and saying we will remediate those uh, clients in, within uh, three years. And I think that AMP is actually the first of, uh, of the companies with a major aligned network to be able to actually make that statement. Well, that's within three years of 1 July 2018. Yes. So the possible maximum period has been shortened to about 12, 11 or 12 years. Yes. Is that right? And I wonder, though, about the true value of that confidence. And I just want to test this proposition with you. If you had independent financial advisors who were insured and clients came to their, these professional independent financial advisors and received high quality advice, presumably if there were problems with that advice, then as is the case with all other professionals, there would be an insurance policy available, it might even be issued by AMP, that could be called upon in order to meet whatever that liability is. Uh, up to the limit of the policy, but AMP does not write that type of insurance, but uh, up to the limit of the policy. And so the benefit or the confidence for a customer in coming to an AMP aligned advisor is if, what, there's a discovery like the rampant fees for no service problem that it will be possible for AMP to make good that problem? Yes, so AMP has set aside um, uh, $460 million, as we discussed yesterday, to deal with this. There would be several instances in that where the um, level of professional indemnity insurance coverage that was available to a single practice would be a fraction of, of that and may not be adequate to meet it. Um, AMP, because of its size and the, uh, and the capital base that it has, is, is saying it will stand behind that. Um, uh, benefiting the customer uh, to the detriment of its shareholders. It seems though, and you're not the only entity that makes this point, but it does seem like an extraordinary proposition that a large financial services entity would say it's possible for us to preside over an almost unimaginable level of withholding money from or taking money from clients and not providing service to them, but at least clients can have confidence that 12, 17 years later, we'll still have the capital backing to be able to repay that money to them. Well, I think the clients should have confidence in a large financial institution that it might take us a while, but ultimately we will do the right thing to remediate them. It just seems like rather than having confidence that you will ultimately have the financial capacity to fix such an enormous problem, it would be preferable if it was possible to have confidence that the problem wouldn't arise in the first place. Absolutely, I agree with you. And the <coughs> first reason that you gave, working back through reverse order, is the spreading of costs. Of fixed costs. Of fixed costs. And I'd like to understand this, if we can, as you know, the, at least a number of other major advice entity or a number of other, or a number of major retail banks are exiting from wealth management. Yes. And 
a point that has been made to us even by an entity that may not have made a decision about exactly what the future is, is that the cost of providing high quality advice is quite high. Yes. And that when you have a large advice network, as the big four banks have had and as AMP has had, that the costs of having the compliance systems necessary in order to provide high quality advice is, and the controls necessary for high quality advice is very high. Yes. And is there some efficiency that you think it's possible to have in relation to those controls that somehow reduces the cost of advice? I think it's, um, my, my point was the broader cost base of, uh, of these organisations and the, the advice network, not just the, um, the compliance systems that go with them, but there is um, uh, premises costs, there are other systems uh, costs, um, uh, things such as practice management software where the buying power of an AMP would be much greater than, say, an independent um, uh, 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 financial advisor uh, and hence that, that that can reduce the overall cost to the advice network and ultimately the cost to the customer. Most of your advisors though, most of your aligned advisors aren't, in fact none of your aligned advisors are operating from an AMP premises are they? I think uh, some operate out of uh, uh, AMP owned premises but the, the other point is that um, uh, most are using um, uh, practice software that is, uh, uh, that is sourced for them by, by AMP uh, and at a, uh, a charge that would be uh, less because of the volume that we can uh, achieve than a, an independent practice would be able to achieve. If we just take premises to begin with, most of them will be operate. There will be small advice businesses operating from their own premises, you yes. agree? So that doesn't seem to really be a meaningful scale benefit to the cost of advice. Yes. So what we're left with is computer systems or computer software. And your point is that the AMP scale means it can in some way reduce the cost of the computer software. Yes. And do you have some idea of what percentage of the cost involved in delivering advice is just having the software? I, I, I don't, Mr Hodge. I mean, presumably the vast majority of the cost must be of involved in providing advice. It's probably not a fixed cost, it's a variable cost, which is the amount of time involved in providing the advice. That would be a, 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 a large component of it, but... Um, also, there is um, just practical uh, considerations around the uh, record keeping and the systems that uh, sit behind that record keeping that are important. It's just difficult, I think, to see immediately what the case is for the efficiencies of a vertically integrated product manufacturer and advice business given the, nat the change to the nature of the role of advisors, because what it appears is that this is more like a roll up in the sense that you've, you've accumulated many advice businesses at a time when it made sense to do so because they could act as a distribution network. And it makes a lot less sense now. Well, certainly um, uh, one of the things that we are less fixated on today than um, uh, in the past is the overall size of the of the network. Um, uh, I've said uh, publicly that the number of advisors is not a, a measure of success for us. What is a measure of success is um, uh, the uh, uh, professionalism, the productivity and the compliance that, uh, that we see through the network. And um, we discussed yesterday uh, that we do expect that there will be people exiting from the um, network. In fact, we've exited um, uh, uh, during the course of this year almost 200 uh, higher risk practices because we do want to make sure that 
that uh, those that are there are, are seen as uh, professional compliant and that we get the productivity benefits that, that attach to those. Attend to that document, Commissioner. Board papers for uh, AMP Limited, AMP Life, NMLA meeting 21 June 18, AMP 6000 exhibit 7.118. I've no further questions, Mr. Wilkins, yes. Commissioner. Mr. Hollow. I have no examination, Mr. Commissioner. Thank you very much. Mr. Wilkins, you may step down. Thank you, Commissioner. Down, Mr. Hodge. Commissioner. I believe the next witness is Mr. Elliott from ANZ. Could, would it be convenient to take a 10 minute break? Thank you, Commissioner. Yes.